Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. And now, Story Time. I was hunting deer alone and shot a buck from much longer range than I should have. It looked like it was badly wounded, but it managed to run away. I gave chase and for most of that while it was out of my sight. After a mile or so of running I caught sight of the buck a couple hundred feet away. The animal was not moving and had been finished off by another hunter. That person was at the buck's rear end and looked like he was humping it. I didn't even consider getting a closer look at that point. I might have had a legitimate claim to part of the buck's corpse, but claiming the meat was the last thing on my mind. I bolted out of there faster than I could have managed while chasing after it, praying the whole time he didn't notice me. As long as there's crazy deer humpers in the woods, I'm not going back there. I've hunted quite a bit when I was in my 20s, not so much now. The one that really stands out was when I was walking through unfamiliar woods and I just got the feeling something was watching me. Like something was hunting me and not the other way around. I never saw anything. No tracks, no tufts of fur, nothing to suspect an animal was hunting me, but I just couldn't shake the feeling. Only time I've ever been out in the woods and got that uneasy. I've held off on sharing this story for a few years now because of how bad it frightened me. However, reading other people's experiences on Reddit has given me the confidence to share my story, and not fear judgment. A few years ago, my partner and I, decided to take a trip to California to see some of the state parks, ghost towns, and off the beaten path things that don't get a lot of tourist traffic. For the first leg of the trip everything went great, We camped in our car, found some really great picturesque landscapes, creepy ghost towns, scenic views and forgotten highways. I absolutely loved it. After about a week and a half on the road, we decided it was time to start heading back to Oregon, our home base, but we decided to take the scenic route for Summit, instead of just driving straight home on the 5. Our meandering path home took us to the Death Valley area where there was a short hike to a beautiful waterfall we had seen online and wanted to do before heading back. In lieu of my experiences, I've chosen not to share the name for everybody's safety. We found the trailhead without issue, and began the mile hike to the waterfall. Death Valley is pretty desolate, and I'm not going to lie, it's a creepy place, that spooked me bad on more than one occasion but something about this trail was different, sinister even. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I couldn't hear anybody around us, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary, there were no cars at the trailhead when we got there so I figured we were alone, but I didn't feel that way. The feeling persisted until we reached the end of the mile hike and saw the waterfall, we sat for a moment, took a few pictures, and started hiking back towards the car. I still felt like something was wrong. I felt eyes on me and had a feeling of dread, for seemingly no reason at all. I tried to shake it off, but I just couldn't. I started walking a little quicker to our car, we got there without incident, and starting throwing our hiking poles and water bottles into the backseat of the car. I noticed there was a black SUV with limo tinted windows parked next to us in the trailhead parking lot, it wasn't running, I didn't see anyone around it and it didn't seem like anybody was in it but where was the driver? The only place the driver could have been was on the same trail as my partner and I, but I hadn't seen or heard the driver on the trail. It was an out and back trail with steep rocky cliffs on either side of the trail, so the chances of me seeing the driver were pretty high, and the chances of him being off the trail were pretty slim as the undergrowth was extremely heavy until you got to the cliff side. I also am certain I would have heard somebody crashing through the undergrowth near the trail. As I was thinking about this and getting more and more anxious, I see a huge man emerge silently from the bushes next to the trail to the waterfall. When I say silently I mean it, he made no noise at all. He was easily 6 foot 4 to 6 foot 6, strong looking, 
Covered in what my partner believes are criminal tattoos, he had a baseball cap pulled down low over his sunglasses, a long full beard, some kind of a rifle slung across his back, and a large hunting knife on his belt. Had he been out there at the falls with us that whole time? If so, why hadn't I heard or seen him? He was holding what appeared to be a cell phone in his hands, and waving down my partner. My partner is a 5 foot 5 and skinny, in a silent panic I grabbed him by the arm to keep him from getting too close to the man. I realize now that this huge man had a gun and distance to him was irrelevant but as I said, I was in panic mode. The man said that he had found this cell phone, the one in his hands, near the waterfall, and didn't want us to leave without it. We both quickly checked our pockets, and realized that we both had our cell phones and we both assumed at the same time that this was some sort of setup for a robbery or something far more sinister. We jumped into the car, fired her up and drove up the dirt road as quick as we could. The man just stared at us through the rear window as we drove off. It terrifies me to think that he was out there with us the whole time we were hiking and we didn't hear him, see him, or even know he was there. How many other times has something like this happened to me? I never would have known the man was out there with us had he not chosen to make his presence known. I'm not going to lie it really made me think twice about hiking alone in the woods, or in isolated and desolate areas. I also find myself wondering what would have happened had we chosen to engage with him, were there others with him? What would have happened to us? I'm not going to lie. I've had nightmares about this man in several instances since this happened. I'm just glad I trusted my gut. Thanks for reading. This happened to me a few years ago, in springtime. I was geocaching by myself, as I usually do. I had chosen one that was along a long abandoned and ripped up railway near some residences and a converted factory. Basically this pathway ran between the two of them. It was still pretty wooded and you couldn't see the houses or much of the factory from the path. I found the cash and signed it, cleaned it up a bit, and put it back. It was a pretty bright, late spring day. Maybe late April or early May. As I stepped from the brushy area the cash was in back onto the path, I looked to my right, where I had come from, and saw a man coming. He was carrying a rifle and was about 200 feet away. Luckily he was looking off to the side and did not see me so I stepped back off the path and around the large bush, commonly known as birdberry, a very dense growth habit, that the cache was hidden behind. I was at this point about 15 to 20 feet away from the path. I waited. And watched the area of path I could see. He walked by looking from right to left, not fast or slow just walking. He held the rifle in his left hand. He did not see me because I was somewhat behind the bush and back. I waited what I felt like was long enough to let him get a ways down the path before cautiously emerging, looking in the direction he had gone to assure he was no longer in sight, and running in the opposite direction to my car. I know it definitely was not any type of hunting season because my ex was a hunter so I know when they are. Plus it was far to close to the houses to shoot a firearm. Hasn't stopped me from cashing alone though. I live in the United Kingdom and live in the countryside. I live on a moderately busy lane and have loads of fields behind my house. Five minutes up the road there's a hill, it's called Coal Peak, changed for privacy, in Gloucestershire. It's about six fields away from my house and a five minute walk from the road. Me and my two mates go to the peak that overlooks our town and can see the Severn Bridge and a place called Stone House. They smoke weed but I don't so I can't blame it on the weed. We sat up the top for a good hour chilling, we decided to go home as it was around 2 am they walk the roadway as it leads to the town where they live and I decided to walk to the fieldway as I didn't want to walk down the road on my own after my mates turn off, so to get to the fields you have to walk through a little forest for around 1 to 2 minutes, it was pitch black, moon shining bright, stars in the sky. As I said before I don't get scared so I wasn't that bothered, 
I got around two third through the forest when I heard sticks cracking to my left as if something heavy was walking. I just glanced over and presumed it was a fox or badger. I get towards the gate and open it as it leads into the fields that lead to my house. I closed the gate and started to walk and that's when I heard something I will never forget. It sounded like Minecraft creeper but a lot deeper sounding and bigger. I turned around and on the path, I could see this thing, around 6 feet tall and skinny, head shaped like a dog, and had horns. I thought my eyes were playing tricks so I just stood there watching it hoping it was going to vanish. Well to my surprise after around 5 seconds it started to very slowly walk closer and closer until it got to the gate, it was like it didn't know what to do except just stand there. I was sweating, had a red vision, and thought I was going to have an anxiety attack. I slowly walked across the field trying to figure out what the F it was. I looked back about halfway across the field and it was gone. Sigh of relief, can finally calm down and just take a nice walk home. Yeah, that's what I was hoping for. I was in the last field from my house, house in view. I knew all I had to do was jump over my fence and I was in my garden. I got to my fence and hopped over, I felt safe and secure. I was walking across my garden to get to the back door and behind me, my drive light came on. Now this light only comes on if it detects motion or it's really windy and a branch sways in front of it. It wasn't windy nor did I walk past it. All of a sudden I had this fear of getting snatched so I quickly ran to my back door, opened it, and ran to my attic converted room. My skylight window looks over my drive where the light came on and I stood on my bed and looked out the window. That's when I saw this werewolf looking thing with horns, standing there sniffing around the cars. It wasn't a dog, it wasn't small enough to be a badger or a fox, and wasn't a cow or anything like that. I got into bed and just watched movies till the sun came up and slept then. Ever since then I never look out my window at night and never walk through those fields. I honestly don't know what this thing was but it scared the s out of me I won't go out in my garden past 11 pm. So yesterday a man came to our door with a badge and questions, thinking I was a girl who disappeared two years ago. The more we piece it together. The more questions we have. I know it's a long post. But I promise it's necessary to cover all of the weirdness. So for background context, my boyfriend and I moved into this apartment almost exactly two years ago. We came and toured the place and met the previous tenant. She was just a little older than us, quiet but seemed normal. We fell in love with the place. We asked her, is there anything we should know? Any issues or reasons why you're leaving? She said, no, I just unexpectedly came upon a very large sum of money from a car accident. So, I'm breaking the lease and finding something better. Which wasn't really a red flag. At the time, we applied for the place, got approved and were set to move in the following month. We were so excited we packed up all our stuff and drove to the city. But once we walked in, our jaws dropped. It looked like she never moved out. Furniture was scattered everywhere. Tables, chairs, clothes still in the closet, food in the fridge or pantry. The weirdest part was the Christmas tree still half set up with just a handful of ornaments still on it as if she'd started to pack it up and decided she didn't have enough time. Edit, I should mention she did take probably half of her stuff. The TV, bed, dressers etc. So it's possible she just decided she didn't care about the rest. Can't jump to conclusions. I was livid. Not just at her, but at a landlord who didn't even check the condition of the apartment we were moving into. He attempted to call and sent a number of texts with no reply. We eventually accepted defeat and spent hours, and mumbled a number of profanities, moving all of her stuff. We stacked it all up, waiting to hear from her. After a few days we got sick of working around it and tossed it out for street freebies. I kept making jokes the whole time in an attempt to lighten the mood. She must have been on the run. We better make sure we check the vents thoroughly. We didn't think much of it after that. We settled in, eventually, 
and the only time it was ever brought up was as a funny story to tell at parties. Hey remember when that girl came up on some mysterious sum of money, skipped town, and left us to clean up the evidence? Good times. Obviously completely joking. Until yesterday, two years later we get s knock on the door. My boyfriend answers, and I, being nosy, stand a few feet behind him in the living room. There's a tall guy at the door in street clothes with a badge around his neck. He cut right to the chase. Do you two live here? He asked. My boyfriend says, yes we both do. Why? He looks past my boyfriend at me and says my business is actually with her. Can I talk to you, ma'am? I feel my heart drop in my butt and approach the door. He told me he needed to see my ID. I froze for a second and asked why and he said I'm looking for the woman who lives here and need to confirm your identity. So I bring it, shaking, heart racing, because I can only assume this man is law enforcement. There must be a mistake, I didn't do something wrong. Did I? He glances at it, looks up at me and hands it back. You're not X? I sighed, relieved and laughed a little. I said, no. She's the previous tenant. She hasn't lived here for years. He doesn't smile, just kind of furrowed his brow and asked. Are you related to her? I shook my head, no. We only met once, two years ago when we toured this place. He then asks, so you haven't been in contact with her? And so I repeat myself, no. I'm sorry. All we know is we still get a ton of her mail. Well, that makes sense, he said. She disappeared. Probably been in hiding for two years. This is the last known address. He pulls out his phone. Can I get your landlord's number? I provide it, and apologize because I can't remember his last name. He doesn't care. I don't want all that. It doesn't matter. He punches the number in, nods, and leaves. Later that night we're talking to friends or family and they asked us if he had mentioned if we should be concerned for our safety. After all, we were living in the apartment of a missing girl who might have committed a crime. We considered this and thought maybe it would be smart to give a call. Then we realized he never gave us a number. In fact, he never even gave us his name. He never showed credentials or said who he worked for. Never took my name or statement. We just assumed he was law enforcement because of the badge. Then we start realizing how completely strange the entire interaction was. In hindsight, the whole thing started to feel very very off. We considered maybe he was a private investigator, but I didn't think they just walk up to the door like that. Bounty hunter was a possibility but bounty hunters don't have badges, according to Google, at least, and in the city we live in cops are required to identify themselves. So who the heck was this guy at our door? I have a lot of theories and every single one sounds like a true crime story. We reached out to the landlord and 24 hours later no one called him or followed up. We can't find anything about the previous tenant, no public records, articles, her Facebook hasn't been touched in. Drumroll. Two years. As far as we know, no one reported her missing and we can't find any warrants for her, either. Maybe I watch too much television, Maybe I'm paranoid, but nothing adds up. I wonder if this man could have been following me, or watching us for some time thinking I was the girl who disappeared. From afar I guess it's possible. We're both similar height and build, petite, close in age, dark brown hair and blue eyes. I wouldn't exactly say we were twins, but on paper, I can see how I would fit her description. It creeps me out though thinking someone could have been watching me. The whole thing rubs me the wrong way. The pieces don't fit. The story is just... Creepy. On October 10th, 2020, I was out bass fishing with my buddy and his son and another friend over at the cooling pond near the power plant south of Marseille, Illinois. This location is in LaSalle County, in southern Illinois. It was very warm that day and we decided to take the chance to get some late season fishing done before it got too cold to be out on the water. 
We were at our usual spot over by one of the barriers, about a mile and a half from the boat launch where the water is about 15 feet deep. We were sitting around talking and casting our lines, it was about 6 p.m. and we were just about to wrap it up for the day and head on back to the house. My buddy's son saw it first and said look at that big bird over there. We all looked to see this thing fly over the top of us, it must have been 20 to 30 feet up in the air and it was moving silently. It wasn't squawking and making noise like a flock of goose would and it was barely moving its wings. We watched it as it flew over us and in the direction of the power plant, and we seen that it looked like a tall man with really big wings. It flew off toward the plant without making any changes in its path until it was out of sight. We saw nothing else after that and we decided that it was enough for us to call it a day and head back to the launch before the sun went down. It was gun deer season in Northern Y. I was sitting in an open tree stand that was relatively low to the ground. In front of me, to my left was dense shrubbery and to my right, there was an opening before the wood started. All of the sudden, I heard some rustling in the bushes to the left. Two little fluff balls came tumbling out into the open area. Initially, I had no idea what they were. I was intently focused on them trying to figure out what animal this was. Then I heard the deepest and scariest growling coming from behind me. I immediately froze. Next thing I knew, I had a mother bobcat circling my tree. It might have only been a minute or two, but it felt like an eternity. She continued circling the tree, growling at me and never taking her gaze off of me. Finally the cubs decided they were done playing and everyone moved on. I will never forget the sound of that growl and the intensity of the bobcat's eyes staring at me. After I came back in, I told this story to my dad. He seemed rather excited, saying that he hasn't seen any wild bobcats in the area yet. However, I did not feel so lucky about the encounter at the time. I was spear fishing at night with a pretty powerful flash light when out of the dark came this foot long snake looking thing. Almost gave me a heart attack. Turned out to be a ragworm swimming towards my face. A couple of minutes later, another one came swimming at me. Ten minutes later the water was full of these long suckers all around me in the dark. Creeped me out. Turned out it was mating season, which makes them leave their holes in the sand swimming up to release their sperm by destroying their bodies, dying in the procès. Torch light must have been drawing them out as if it was the full moon or something. I'll be checking for ragworm mating season every time I'm planning to go spear fishing. Edit, people have been asking why I spear fish at night. Species are the same, trout, flatfish etc., but they're closer to the shore and more relaxed at night. In some countries too many people take advantage of the fact that it's a bit easier to take the fish in the dark. This has lead to spear fishers getting bad reputation. In many countries spear fishing at night is illegal. So will it be in all of EU this year, because some spear fishers without moral are taking too many fish in southern Europe. It's sad to see the sport being ruined by people just wanting money not caring for nature. I only take the fish I can eat for myself and my family, if I find any at all. So should anybody else. It's important to take care of the nature. Be responsible. Edit 2. In Denmark the largest predators at sea are the seal and the porpoise, not nightmare fuel, just a tiny whale. It's quite safe to go in at night time in Denmark, besides the horny worms. Okay, so I'm not sure if this is a creepy encounter, but it was pretty creepy for a Halloween day at sunset for me. I was walking my dog in Vermont on a class 4 road, a road that the town doesn't maintain well, about a quarter mile from my house, as I do almost every day for the past 3 years. There is a very short road that leads to the river and is right behind my neighbor's house, who also has a dog. As we were walking up the road, my dog pulled me into the woods about five steps. 
She was adamant about smelling whatever was over there. When I looked up, I saw the most vile thing I have ever seen, aside from a horror movie, the warm, steaming entrails of what must have been a large animal. We were still about 10 feet away, so I paused for a moment, honestly thinking it was a Halloween prank. But what I believe happened was that a hunter had gutted an animal and left the guts in the woods. I was shaken at the sight, as I am not a hunter, and it was creepy and horrifying. We turned around, and I had to pick up my small dog because she was so interested in the smell. Although this isn't a well-maintained road, local people and tourists still use it. Three or four cars drove past me on our way down. I felt bad that my dog wasn't really getting her normal walk, so we went down the offshoot road to the river, as we had done so many times before. It wasn't even a three-minute walk, and I want to stress that this is a road that people use, even though it leads to the river. As we approached the water, I could see the back of my neighbor's house at this point, I noticed that there was a gray jeep parked across the river. I pulled my dog back towards the main road, but she was in attack mode, because we never see people across the river, I think, and didn't want to come, so I coaxed her with some treats. Then the jeep's engine started. I started walking faster and picked up my dog. The jeep began inching towards the river and eventually across it. I'm running at this point up the hill. I was trying to call my sister using Siri on my phone because I was scared and I wanted someone to know what was happening. I got back up to the other road and started bolting towards a gated area because I didn't think the jeep could follow me. Before I could squeeze through the gate, the man yelled, Hey, you, I need to talk to you. I was really scared, but I thought maybe if I was nice, he wouldn't kill me. He said, Hey, just to let you know, it's hunting season, and I almost shot you. I actually do know it is hunting season, which is why both my dog and I had bright reflective pink vests on. I have never seen a hunter there in the six years I've lived on this road. You can't be walking there during hunting season. We all need to do our part, he said shortly. I abandoned my instinct to be kind at this point and said, I'll do my part wearing a vest if you do your part by not shooting at me. He didn't like that. He shook his head in anger and stepped on the gas, peeling away. I'm sorry for all the detail, but I want to emphasize that hunters have never been allowed to hunt so close to my home before, and I intend to contact our local game wardens and town clerk to confirm that on Monday just so we are all safe. Thanks for reading about my creepy encounter from Halloween. I will be locking myself in my bedroom for the rest of the night now. Back in 2005, a friend and I were walking home at about 2 o'clock in the morning, about 6 kilometers across Narrabri, which edges the Pilliga Forest in New South Wales, Australia. We were going from one friend's place to another. We were only about one kilometer away from home on about a 500 meter stretch of a straight road. We were walking along a sidewalk. My friend was pushing my BMX as we were just talking shit as we usually did when all of a sudden something caught my eye. Two greyhound-like dogs, but larger, probably twice the size. They ran out of a block of flats and jumped the brick mailboxes on the inside of the footpath on the other side of the road, which stood about three to four feet high. Both of these dogs landed in the middle of the road and then ran in the opposite direction to which we were walking. As they ran further away they grew larger and larger in size. While they grew larger they seemed to begin to stand up on their hind legs and morph into some large muscular werewolf looking creature and in my mind I could not comprehend what I saw. These creatures ran around the corner in the exact direction we walked from and about 5 to 10 seconds after they turned the corner we heard what sounded like a female child scream. At that point, we both looked at each other and I could tell he saw what I had seen as he was just about to haul ass and bail on me on my bike. I jumped on the handlebars and he pedaled like I've never seen before. I don't think he skipped a pedal for the whole rest of the trip home. When we got home we locked the doors and closed the windows and I asked him to explain exactly what he saw to me and to no surprise it was exactly as I had witnessed. He was an indigenous Australian, as was his elder brother. 
We explained the experience to him and he said it was probably a Yowie which I believed at the time, but this story is not typical of Yowie sightings in Australia. Safe to say this scared me to go out at night for quite a while. We told a few people about the experience afterward but most of the time people would laugh or joke that we were on drugs or brought up hairy man, which is a slang term for a yaoi, while drinking. I can assure you this was the same thing we told them. This was a completely sober experience. After the joking and carrying on I pretty much kept this story to myself, only telling a select few people who want to hear paranormal stories. I don't try to convince anyone if it's real or not, they can decide for themselves. I know what I saw. I go walking in the woods near my place and three terrifying things have happened, and every single one was in the same section of trail. The first was one of the earliest times I went walking. I wasn't entirely sure of my timing to get to the opposite end of the woods and back, and I ended up walking two-thirds of the way back in the dark. I had a flashlight which I could use part of the time, but wasn't able to leave on. I would flash it on, set my course, and walk until I felt I needed to check again. I'm walking through the pitch dark, and I hear something about 50 yards back scream. It scared the shit out of me. I picked up my pace a bit when suddenly whatever it was screamed again. About 15 feet away at my 11 o'clock. I hadn't heard anything move and I booked it. I leaned later that it may have been foxes, but I never went walking out there again without a means of self-defense. The second time was in late afternoon walk. Same spot on the trail, I was walking and it was almost Disney-like. Birds singing, bugs chirping, squirrels. Squirreling? There was a small breeze and it was lovely out. Suddenly, at the exact same time, the wind stopped, the sun dropped behind a cloud, and every single animal stopped doing anything. The entire woods went completely still and silent. I had never understood deafening silence until that moment. I tensed up and kept moving and about 10 seconds later, sound returned and everything went back to normal. I took the same way back and it didn't happen again. The third time was about a month later. I was walking down that way and I was looking about a little more, as this time I was out at midday and it was as bright as deep woods gets. I noticed something off the trail and went to look at it. I found a deer trail that I could follow and realized that the high grass hit a deep ditch off that trail that the river cut out during flooding. It had been dry, so I dropped into it. I'm a big dude at about 6.5 feet tall and the edge of this ditch was at my eye level and probably about 10 feet across. I decided to follow it and come out at the river and then work my way down the bank until I hit the trail again. I walked about 25 feet and had to work over a tree that had collapsed into the ditch at a curve in its path. I came to the other side and froze. There was deer everywhere. Not plural deer, a single deer spread over the entirety of the ditch. The ribs were closest, the skull was across the ditch from them, and all the other bones were scattered about like it had hit a land mine. There was a definite stench to the area and the bones were dry but still had sinew strung about them in spots. It took me all of about three seconds to realize that I was standing in something's dining room. I backed up to the tree, used it as my point of egress from the ditch and, ignoring the voice in my head saying not to bust straight through the underbrush to the path busted straight through the underbrush to the path. I came out at, you guessed it, that creepy spot on the woods trail. I walked swifty to a different trail, and walked through the open field to get home. I don't know precisely what lives in that section of the woods, but it always freaks me out to see parents taking their toddlers out there to walk. It's a curvy path up to that section, which is a straightaway with flat ground and the underbrush making a well-defined path. I know people let their kids run up and down it since they can see all the way to end and the kids have the ability to run freely without being out of sight. I know it's probably not going to happen, but I always mentally see a kid running away from his parents down the path, a rustle of brush, a flash of fur, and the sound of little Billy being carried off into the woods.
Well I wasn't hunting at the time but at the age of 6 I was exploring the wooded area in between my grandparents house and a retirement community and I stumbled upon what I believed to be a large gummy toy snake. I proudly paraded my new snake all through the surrounding parks and neighborhoods before I returned home. My new friend was immediately confiscated by my grandmother, and it took me until high school to understand why my grandfather almost died laughing at me. I had discovered an abandoned 14-inch double-ended dildo. So me and my friend were going on a walk around 3 a.m. and I live in a rural or country area. Half city, half county. We went to a field to relax. There are town homes nearby. It is 3 a.m. so I don't expect much. This place has no history of being dangerous. A burglary happened a few blocks down from where we were. But that was two years ago. Since, the neighborhood has been quiet. I recently visited an old barn ground. That burned down in the 80s. It is an empty lot. We were just sitting and talking about my personal life. When we both heard a loud bang few miles away, judging from sound. I indicated it could potentially have been fireworks, and we continued with our conversation. No more than five minutes later we heard what appeared to be a human whistling that seemed to be low-pitched and coming from the right side of the neighborhood. At times it seemed to be close, others seemed to be far. I had a knife on me and challenged the person or thing making the noise, I had told whoever that they should show themselves. No response. So I whistled a high-pitched tone. I immediately got a response back, same medium pitched whistle. Not high or low at this point. We continued home but it seemed as if it was following us. I heard it one last time before going back in the house. I would like some responses indicating what this could be. Thanks. Please share your experiences. This is an experience from the past and something that happened recently that scared the crap out of me. Sorry if some of what I write doesn't make sense. My adrenaline was going through the roof, and my fight or flight instincts kicked in. I live in a rural southwestern Louisiana backwater. For a few months now something weird has been hanging around and outside my house. The first time it became apparent was one night I was in the basement. Outside the window is a porch and there is a light switch for the lights by the door. I went upstairs for a bit when I realized later I left the lights on, so I went downstairs to turn them off. When I came down the porch lights were on. Now my father has tried endlessly to hook them to a timer with no success. I assumed that he had finally figured it out and paid the lights no mind. What I didn't know was my dad had given up weeks ago and put in an average light switch. The next morning I go down and see the lights are still on. I assume the timer didn't work so I go to shut them off, and then discover to my shock it's a switch. This caused me to panic a bit because that meant someone had been out there while the rest of my family was asleep last night and quite likely they could have been watching me. A few weeks later I'm sitting downstairs on the couch. I'm home alone, it's dead of night and my dog. Suddenly she perks up and looks to the window. Out of habit I look with her and see something hunched and white dropping down over our fence and run past the windows. Thanks to the dirty windows and the glare of the lights I couldn't even hope to make out what I saw or how big it was but I panicked and called my buddies. They were skeptical and told me it was probably a raccoon and I ended up agreeing. I went outside with my dogs, an older chocolate lab, and my German Puggle, German Shepherd, Pug, Beagle Mix, the one who had been with me. I went out trying to see what it was. Right away my dogs had two very different reactions. The lab was pacing, sniffing, looking around, and being very anxious. The other was wagging her tail and looking at the trees the way she does when I have treats. Suddenly from said trees I hear a loud groan. These are big strong old trees and they don't groan, not unless something is on them. I ended up going inside cause my puggle was moving between the trees with the same look while my lab seemed to be getting increasingly anxious but now was staying away from the trees and just watching them. I wasn't seeing anything. 
But all night I heard weird things. The worst was a loud slam. It was like a tree branch had fallen but there was nothing there. My puggle kept going to windows and acting unhappy about being kept in. But the rest was like the sound of something on the roof, pebbles being thrown at the window, and the return of a woodpecker who should have been dead after my cats got the poor thing with a vengeance. It's been a couple of months since that incident and I have mostly forgotten about it. Occasionally I'll hear something weird on the front porch or footsteps or the porch lights will get turned on mysteriously. But these are small things. On a recent night, I was with my sister and FaceTiming with a friend in the basement, when we heard a screeching sound. I run to the window in the next room where I believe I'll be able to see whatever it is from a safe distance. But I instead let out a scream and a flurry of curse words. Outside standing taller than me for sure, I'm six feet, was a gaunt white humanoid figure with its back turned to the window. When I got back to the window and looked back out it was nowhere to be seen. I at first thought it was my mind playing tricks on me. There was snow on the ground and I was dying for a rational explanation because it scared me. I was shaking. I told my sister and she laughed at me. I went upstairs later that night and got everything ready for the night and locked up. When I went back up front I froze. I could see my cat, who seemed agitated, on the garage roof looking at something on my porch. That something was the same white figure with its back turned again except this time it was squatting and looking at my cat. It didn't seem confrontational itself. But then for God's sake, this sent me into tears. It turned its whole body, twisted, and it seemed to kind of straighten as it did. I can only think of a meerkat as an example. But it was so sudden I was sure I heard bones crack through the window. I never saw the face. As soon as it turned my flight or flight kicked in and ran into my room as fast as I could. The last thing I saw of it, as I slammed my door, was it on the railing as it leapt towards what I assume was the nearby tree. I spent several hours in my room shaking and wheezing in a hysterical fit. I like paranormal stuff but it's hard when you are experiencing it. Now, that I calmed down enough to type I've been thinking about its actions, and back to the previous events. I'm trying to explain this to myself. I at first drew a comparison to the crawler humanoid creature. But this thing seemed calm and relaxed most of the time. I don't know what I saw and it's freaking me out. I was walking out of the woods one night with my bow and my tree stand on my back. I kept hearing something walking behind me and when I would stop it would stop. I would start walking and so would it. I kept turning around and looking with my flashlight but couldn't see anything. I got freaked out and started running. It started running as well. I'm literally on the verge of having a heart attack when I realized it was my tree stand strap dragging the ground about 15 foot behind me. This was back in 2012 but it still gives me the heebie-jeebies when I think about it. I had just gotten out of a bad relationship and was living with my grandparents. Hunting for apartments and I found a house that was only a few blocks from the group home I work at. I thought, great. Even in the snowy weather I'd be able to walk to work. I call the number on the Craigslist ad and set a time to check it out. I boogie on over and am greeted by a man in his mid-30s. He seemed very awkward at first but showed me around and said if things worked out I could take my pick of either of the available bedrooms. He started making small talk and was becoming increasingly weird, he was asking me questions about how old I was, if I smoked pot, if I was single. Not totally red flags but the way he came off was weird, nonetheless. I say I have to go and he gives me the email of the homeowners. Turns out it was his girlfriend's parents place. So I dawdle on home and email the couple giving my references and income info, as one does. A couple days later the husband calls me and says hastily that the rooms are no longer available. I'm a little miffed but what can I do about it, right? Cut to a week later, my friend and I are hanging out, smoking pot and just shooting the shit. 
I can't remember how it came up but she mentioned that there's a website where you can see all the registered S offenders. Of course our curiosity takes over and we look it up. I think you know where this is going. We scroll and scroll and eventually apartment man. My jaw drops and I can't believe what I'm seeing. His charge? Incest with a minor. I don't know if anything would have happened but I'm glad the homeowners turned me down. And what dumb luck that I stumbled across the website a week after. Not really a horror story, but just so unusual and weird. I was selling a car on Craigslist and finally got a solid nibble. A woman wanted to buy it for her teenage daughter, so I offered to drive it over so she could look at it and take it out for a test drive. I show up and knock on the door. The mother is happy I'm there and she invites me in, asks if she can take it out for a test drive, drops about 4k in my hand, and takes off with her daughter, leaving me standing in the living room with the cash and a friendly white dog. I awkwardly sit down and about 10 minutes later the husband comes up and he acts like it's perfectly normal for me to be there and we chat a bit. The mother and daughter come home, agree to buy the car, I sign the title over, make arrangements for a friend to come and get me, I didn't think they would buy it, and chit chatted with this couple for about 20 minutes until my friend came and rescued me. This happened just over a week ago. Ordered a liquid lipstick and didn't like the color, so resold it at below market price. Guy comes to pick it up, it's some high school aged kid from the hood. Assumed he was getting it for his girlfriend and figured he could save himself $5 and shipping getting a slightly used one and she wouldn't know the difference. Met him in ratty sweats with no makeup and wet hair. Thought nothing of it. That night at 3 AM, I got a text from him saying baby you look so beautiful today and asking how I'd like to make some quick money. I didn't answer, thought maybe he was drunk and texted the wrong number, went back to sleep. The next day he called, I didn't answer and blocked the number. He texted me from another number, I responded, no, thanks and blocked the number. Five minutes later, he called again from yet another number. Didn't answer. He left a voicemail asking once again if I wanted to make quick money and informing me that if so, all I had to do was Venmo him $200 right away. I blocked the number. Five minutes later, I got six texts from yet another number. Blocked it. Quiet for a few hours, then came back at me on another number. This went on for about four days. Back in the early 2000s, when I was fresh out of college, I landed a job at a nondescript office building with a handful of cubicles and a water cooler that never seemed to run out of gossip. I drove a big, old 80s car with an enormous trunk, the kind of vehicle that had seen better days but still had a certain vintage charm. Little did I know, that car would become a bizarre chapter in my life. One day, my supervisor approached me with an unusual request. It wasn't Craigslist, but he asked to test drive my car. Now, this wasn't a common occurrence, and I hesitated for a moment. But hey, he was a supervisor, and there wasn't any obvious reason to say no. So, I handed him the keys, and off he went, cruising around the block in my clunky, nostalgia-inducing ride. After the test drive, he returned without much fanfare. He didn't end up buying the car, and to be honest, I wasn't surprised. My vintage vehicle had seen its fair share of miles, and it was probably due for the scrapyard. Fast forward almost a decade later, and my old supervisor made headlines. It turns out he was being extradited to the US because he had been found guilty of several murders. The news sent shockwaves through the office grapevine, and I found myself caught in a whirlwind of disbelief. As the details of his crimes emerged, I couldn't help but wonder about that peculiar test drive. Why was he specifically looking for cars with lots of trunk space? Had my old 80s relic somehow been connected to his sinister deeds? The realization sent shivers down my spine, 
and I began to question the oddities of that seemingly innocuous request. The mind has a curious way of re-evaluating past events in light of newfound knowledge. What seemed like a simple test drive at the time now took on a sinister undertone. I couldn't help but play out various scenarios in my head, each one more chilling than the last. Did he have something hidden in the trunk? Or was it just a macabre coincidence that he happened to choose a car with ample storage space for his twisted endeavors? To this day, the mystery lingers in the back of my mind, a bizarre footnote in my life's narrative. It serves as a stark reminder that sometimes, the most ordinary moments can hide the darkest secrets, and the past has a way of revealing its true colors in the most unexpected and unsettling ways. Alright, so times are tough in Brooklyn and I recently found myself in need of a quick place to stay. Moved onto a houseboat in December, dealt with enough batshit craziness to last me a lifetime, moved out in February to stay with my girlfriend for a week or two and hunt in the miracle section of Craigslist, price X, cheap rooms shared hastily, bullshit ranges from 6 to 11 but you're in a hurry, don't complain. I find a pretty solid spot a few blocks away. Price is right for a basement in this part of town so I go to check it out. It's a total farm. You see them occasionally in New York City, walls knocked out and replaced with little cordoned off dorms, one window outside, one plexiglass window in, actually NGL never seen that one, first suspicion, four to six rooms to a floor, communal bathroom. At least the $13 sandwiches down the street are great. But I digress what struck me was how many laptops my super had. We're in the office, figuring out the rental agreement, and they're everywhere. Stacks, some old, some pretty new. He says the one room just went but I could have the other new one. I wonder who's leaving cheap housing in the city. Big stacks of laptops, cables for laptops. I go to shower downstairs and remember I left my towel at girlfriend's place. Got the hunch to check the other semi-anomaly and quickly found a towel, but man, the anomaly, an enormous pile of stuff from previous tenants at the other end of the basement. Some new. Some not so new. At this point I'm giving it all a bit of pause, but I go take my shower and change. Farms have turnover, but that's a lot of stuff, and who leaves clean towels? One of the other housemates comes out of his dorm as I'm leaving mine having showered and changed. Hey man, I just moved in here. Me too. Room was really cheap. I don't even have a laptop. Am I gonna get zip tied and fed to billionaires? Why are there other people just moving in here, on the same day? Why is everyone who's left leaving behind useful shit? Why the hell does my room have a tiny plexiglass window? Why didn't I care three days ago when I needed a place bad? I could charitably be described as a total idiot, but I know my horror movies, and I don't know what to do with this many horror movie warnings. In 2011, it was around August, and I had been searching for a dress for my sister's wedding for weeks. Since I didn't have much money and would wear the dress only once, I decided to check Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. Luckily, I found a dress that looked great on me, and I loved its style and colors. Excitedly, I contacted the seller on Craigslist and planned to meet her at her house the next day to buy the dress. However, I started to feel unsure about going alone when she gave me her address. The area was not safe, and many bad incidents happened to women there. The neighborhood was in a run-down rural town, and many houses looked empty. As I drove by them, I checked the address again to be sure before driving up to her house, as I didn't want any trouble in this area. The place felt like where you might find those eccentric, intense people. I knocked on the door, and a woman answered. She looked older than I expected and seemed very tired with big black bags under her eyes. It was a bit unsettling, to say the least. She invited me inside, and I saw the dress hanging on a door handle in the living room. It looked just like the pictures, and I was really happy with how it looked. I felt too nervous to try it on there, 
so I awkwardly held it up against my body to check the size. While I was paying for the dress, something strange happened. The woman's eyes kept moving around the room, and she seemed anxious, like something bad was going to happen. I wasn't sure if she was on drugs or had a mental disability. Out of nowhere, as I was giving her the money, she suddenly lunged at me with her head, but I somehow managed to dodge it. Then I ran out of the house as fast as I could, and I could hear her chasing after me. I got into my car and quickly locked the doors. She started hitting my windows, trying to get inside. I started the car, hit the gas, and drove away as fast as I could, leaving her behind. She was screaming loudly, like someone who wasn't well in their mind. I didn't look back until I reached home, and I probably drove faster than I should have. My mind couldn't understand what had just happened, and I started crying while driving. My heart was pounding as I left that place behind, and my hands were shaking a lot on the steering wheel. I couldn't believe what had just happened. I kept thinking about it over and over, trying to understand why that woman had tried to hurt me. When I got home, I decided to call the police and tell them everything. The police listened to my story and said they would investigate the area where it happened, but even after two weeks, they didn't give me any updates, and I never found out what happened to the woman or why she did that. I tried to forget about it, but I still felt uneasy and worried. I couldn't stop thinking about the woman's scary eyes and how she had jumped at me. I wondered why she acted that way and what she was hiding. I started having bad dreams about her in that house. In my dreams, she was always chasing me, and I couldn't get away. I would wake up feeling sweaty and tired. I knew I had to do something about it. I decided to go back to the house and find out what had happened. I was scared, but I wanted to face my fears. This time I brought my dad and brothers with me. We also took some safety items like mace and a taser in case she tried to attack me again. As we returned to the neighborhood, I realized that the house was gone. All that was left was an empty lot with a few bits of trash still blowing around in the midday breeze. I decided to go next door and ask some of the neighbors if they knew what had happened. It turned out the lady had been sectioned into a mental hospital for biting one of her neighbors who lived further up the lane. He ended up getting infected with a type of mycelium or fungus that apparently, this woman had infested in her bloodstream and brain. I guess this all explained her lunges at me. And now I could finally sleep slightly better, knowing that she was locked away getting the help that she needed. I've been a long time lurker here but have taken a while to post this because I wanted to unearth the messages from this night and knew it would be uncomfortable. This happened 6 years ago. I, 25 female, moved out of my parents' house into an apartment in a big city, with my two male friends. The neighborhood we moved into had previously been a not-so-great area but had been up and coming for some time and I had never felt unsafe there, aside from this night. It was our second night in the apartment. While asleep, I was woken by the sound of cabinets being opened and closed and heavy-sounding boots waking around. I was immediately annoyed, thinking if this was how loud it would be every morning when my roommates got ready for work I would be in for a long lease. As I laid in bed, mind you still half asleep, my bedroom door was opened and the lights turned on. I started to pull my covers off of my head to turn toward the door, and the lights quickly turned off and the door was slammed shut. At this point I was confused why my roommates would come into my bedroom like that. I looked at the clock, and it was 1 AM I had then realized something was not right. I messaged my roommates. Me, who's up? Roommate, me. Me, lol okay. Roommate, yo someone opened my bedroom door. Me, wait me too. It wasn't you? Roommate, no. Me, WTF. Roommate, um WTF? Roommate 2's name? Me, someone turned my light on and had shoes on and went through cabinets? Roommate, dude WTF. I'm gonna get up. We both walked out of our rooms at the same time. We looked toward the living room and noticed the window was open and the blinds were mangled. 
We turned around toward the back door as we heard footsteps on the back porch. I quickly locked the door behind whoever it was, as my roommate grabbed a knife. We called the cops. The only thing they took was an external hard drive. We stayed up for a while unable to fall back asleep, and we shared a can of black olives, lol. I think not seeing the intruder has made it easier to overcome, and I'm fortunate nothing further happened when they opened my bedroom door. We suspect whoever it was thought the apartment was still vacant, but who knows. Not me, but my grandpa. One time he was out by the lake and found a woman's severed head. Another time, he and a friend found the body of an old man who had died of a heart attack while hunting. Both made local news. One time while bow hunting in a tree stand I had three bears walk under my stand right before dark, so when I was ready to leave the stand I yelled at the bears. One of the baby bears climbed up the double tree I was in and was looking down and chomping its teeth at me. I was afraid to leave the stand because the large mama bear was somewhere on the ground in the dark. This happened about an hour ago. It's night, I'm in my home, street level apartment, lying on the sofa and reading the news on my cell. I hear a bike stop outside my house and I see a guy walking up and down the street. I'm thinking it's probably some delivery guy, who is searching for the right address, and I don't pay too much attention. A minute passes by and I see the guy standing outside my yard, less than 10 meters from where I am. I sit up and I ask him if he is searching for something and if he wants any help, without actually standing up or getting outside, since it's hot and the windows are open so he can hear me. He politely replies no, thank you, so this time I think he is waiting for someone and I get back to reading the news. But I'm starting to feel that something isn't right. It's a bit dark outside, there is some light from the street lamp, so I can't really see which direction this guy is looking at. However, I am sensing that he is looking inside my house. I decide to stand up, have a better look and ask him to move and wait a bit further down the road for whoever he was waiting. Only the guy was not waiting for someone. He was just standing there, staring at me and touching himself. I do not know what the normal reaction would be. Mine was shouting at him to go away, cursing him and sending him to hell, while simultaneously closing the shutters. Seconds later I heard the bike leaving. I didn't feel afraid. I felt exposed, creeped out and pissed. I am still very much pissed. Edit, first of all, thank you for your suggestions and your wishes for me to be safe. Secondly, there are a couple of things I didn't initially mention, because they weren't pertinent to what happened, but now I feel I should add, as I am time limited and not able to respond to one by one. I am European. We don't have a gun in the house mentality in my country. Especially in the cities, the only people who have guns are the police and the criminals. In rural areas, the hunters too. But that's about it. We are also not accustomed to security cameras at home. I know no one who is one. I only see them in office buildings, banks, factories and rich people houses. We do all have the classic doorbell cameras, though, which however do not record. Moreover, I don't live alone, I live with my husband who was here last night, but he was in his study doing some late night work. I didn't call for him, I only told him what happened afterwards, which is indicative of how not scared I was. As for the police, you are right about creating a trail. This is a reason why I should report it. Lastly, I luckily didn't see his penis. He was grabbing and touching it on top of his trousers. It was the standing in the dark, staring part that creeped me out more than the general's part. Story time. I visited Yellowstone National Park last week and decided to take our boat out on Yellowstone Lake yesterday. This was our last day, and we wanted to end our trip on a high note. While we were loading our boat into the launch pad, 
there were fishermen from Wisconsin catching trout, cutting them up, and then throwing them back into the lake. This is a government job, aka an angler incentive program to manage the fisheries. One could tell how experienced these men were and how knowledgeable they were about the lakes just by talking to them and watching them work in rhythm, as they probably had for several years. Basically, these guys know their stuff. So, a couple of the older, bigger guys were kind enough to help us get our boat in, we are new to using this boat. The guys told us to be careful, the water has big swells and it's getting windy. In a side conversation, an angler told my dad about the body still lost in the lake and never recovered, including a couple of park rangers. The angler explained that the water is too cold and within 20 minutes, hypothermia has set in. So again, he cautioned us, and we headed out anyway. We didn't make it far, three to five foot swells pushed us back in. It was almost as if the angler was expecting our short return, and he helped us guide the boat back into the dock onto the boat trailer. He just smiled and said, I'm glad you're back. It's bad weather out there. I felt I had to give you the background so you could see why I am so curious about these missing people, bodies in the lake, and park ranger bodies all believed to be at the bottom of Yellowstone Lake. However, I cannot find any information on these missing people and missing rangers. I asked other park employees and researched the National Park website. Nothing. What are your thoughts? Does anyone know about missing people and missing park rangers at Yellowstone Lake? A park ranger discovered me and my friends in a clearing in the middle of the woods, having a competition using unicycles to see if any of us could jump rope while being on a unicycle. The man looked very confused and asked if we were doing anything besides this. We said no, we were just bored. Then he just said, you know you can fish, right? We replied, we already did that, and he just kind of walked away, a little disappointed, I think. Honestly, I believe we were probably the weirdest thing he encountered that day. Maybe he was looking for somebody and found us, who knows. I have worked many different jobs in my lifetime, starting as a janitor. I worked on a farm for about two years at one point, later as a PE teacher in a high school. I was even an officer before eventually moving to New Jersey and getting a job as a park ranger in the Pine Barrens. I moved to New Jersey to be closer to my family. The job didn't seem hard. I worked four days a week and spent all my time in the park, with the other three days off. However, I haven't worked for the park for a very long time, and I'm about to tell you why. I think I lasted a year, and maybe even less than that. I had a series of very strange things happen to me there, and the final straw made me quit my job as soon as I got the chance. I began working at Pine Barrens in April of that year. I was introduced to the job and the park by the park services. The place is humongous, stretching over an area that is 22% of New Jersey. My job was to patrol a certain area and make sure everything was in order. If you've ever visited the Pine Barrens, you would know that abandoned buildings and towns are scattered throughout the park. I would clock in on a Tuesday, work through to Friday, and then Saturday through Monday. The first couple of weeks went smoothly as I got familiar with the woods and my route. However, in the third week, on a Thursday evening, my first spooky experience happened. The park was buzzing with nature sounds, and there were no people around that day. Although sometimes kids like to wander the park at night, looking for ghosts or just a secluded place to hang out, I had not seen any of them either. I was taking mental notes of my surroundings when I noticed a humming and buzzing sound. I couldn't tell where it was coming from at first, but it was getting closer. That's when I looked up and saw three bright lights moving in a circle, almost as if they were spiraling down towards me. Instinctively, I ducked and ran as fast as I could. I probably ran for a couple of hundred feet before turning around to see if the lights were still there, but they were not. The humming had also stopped. I dropped to the ground, trying to gather my composure and catch my breath, 
and also make sense of what had happened five minutes prior. I do believe in aliens, even though I had never had an encounter before. I had no clue what else that could have been, so I kind of agreed with myself that those were aliens, and I wouldn't think about it anymore. My second experience happened about five months after I began working in the park. It was around 7 p.m., and the sun was getting very low in the sky since it was October. As I was going on my regular route, I noticed something lurking behind the trees about a hundred yards away from me. At first, it looked like a person, maybe a man about 5'7". I thought it might have been some college kid playing a prank to scare me. I yelled out that nobody is allowed to be in the woods at this time of year, but he didn't move. It was only after I shouted for the third time that he finally moved in front of the tree, and that's when I could take a good look at him. When I saw him, I nearly had a heart attack. He was dressed in dirty, torn up clothing, but the most disturbing thing about him was his head, or lack of one. I looked at him, not knowing if I should ask what happened to him or just bolt out of there as fast as I could. I froze for a solid three minutes, even though I noticed he had begun moving closer to me. He started running up to me, and as he was getting closer, I realized he was also translucent. This was a poltergeist. Now, when it comes to aliens, I'm a believer, but when it comes to ghosts, I was very skeptical. After that second incident, I decided that as much as I loved being a ranger and working in nature, staying there was not worth it. This hot mess of a place was not worth me risking my sanity for. I called in the next day and explained the situation. They told me that something like this had already happened to their previous rangers. They tried to convince me to stay on the job longer and doubled my pay, but I refused. I would not risk losing my mind for this job. I'm having a hard time remembering the stories told to me by my Navajo family but when I Skype with them again I will ask for me this creepy set of events happened directly to me though so here goes my first personal encounter. I know it's lengthy but hey, skinwalkers they do require a backstory. It started when my two brothers, who we will call David and Luke, and Luke's girlfriend, who we will call Sarah, all drove down to the desert to spend some time out in the country. This is reservation land, as it were, so red dirt was everywhere. This was in southern Utah, a majestically beautiful place if you ever get the chance to visit. We had some pistols and decided to go out and target practice. We took our gear and some old targets to a place called Devil's Heartbeat. I had never been, but all three of them were familiar with the area. It was a canyon about 200 or so feet deep. We stayed on one end of the canyon by the drop-offs, and to our left was the ravine, about 50 feet over. The opposite side of the canyon rose up above us where some other ruins were. The Navajo may disagree with historians on the Anasazi. The Ridge Enon departure, according to Navajo legend, they simply disappeared from existence, leaving behind plates, dishes, food, and went into another dimension or some equivalent. But whatever the history, the Navajo do not like to wander in the. I never asked why but figured it had something to do with disrespect, preserving history, etc. As such, none of the others cared a bit about these canyon ruins. They were more interested in shooting pistols. I could see old beds, ladders, and even cave drawings on the cliffs with just my naked eye, and I got this strange, strange fixation on going over there. I'm not Navajo and felt that their rules didn't apply to me. I set down the cliffs without a rope and decided I would climb down, cross the canyon floor, and then climb back up. This was a bad idea for a million reasons, but it was just like some obsession I can't explain the feeling. It was the magnetism. I wanted to be in those ruins, and it wasn't just a touristy curiosity. It felt like I was meant to go there. I kept slipping and kept getting stuck on the rocks. I was so frustrated, I almost started crying. Finally, I was deterred by the unmistakable sound of a growl coming from the canyon floor below me. There were trees down there, so I couldn't see what was making the growl, but a mountain lion immediately rose to my mind, and I got my ass back up to the cliffside. 
I said nothing to the others, and we shot guns for a while. The only other strange occurrence was while Sarah was aiming, things got eerily quiet. We all heard a sound from behind us, maybe 20 feet away. It was almost a growl, but then a horse laughs, almost like a lion, and then a hyena. We had a clear view of the entire area, and there was nothing, certainly not on the clifftops where we had heard it. Anyway, the creepy part was that while David, Sarah, and I all heard it from a close distance, Luke heard the exact same noise right by his ear. We ended up camping out there to see if anything would happen, and this is when I got completely terrified. Before I was only scared of wild animals. We had guns, though, and were sleeping with no bags or tents, just some blankets under the stars and a little flare, so I felt safe. When we all laid down, I fell asleep pretty quickly, but woke up a few hours later to see everyone else lying with their eyes wide open, listening. The canyon was completely full of noise. The only way to describe it is people banging rocks together. There would be one set maybe 300 yards away, then another clacking 200 yards away, and then 50 yards away. The canyon echoes so it was hard to tell exactly how many rock smacking noises there were going on, but they sounded like Morse code. We listened to this for maybe 10 minutes, no other animal noises, nothing. Finally, David, who is kind of a hard ass and the least superstitious, shouted, shut up. And everything immediately stopped. My heart was in my throat. We just sat there and stared at one another wide-eyed. It was dead quiet, and then we heard another super weird noise from the ruins. I don't know how to explain this one either, but it kind of sounded like a zebra noise, like these squeaky trills. It got louder, and then the rocks, sticks, whatever they were, started up again. But this was worse because now other animal noises came. We heard what sounded like wolves or coyotes barking, monkeys screeching, in my opinion, those were the most terrifying, owls hooting, and through it all, the terrible zebra noises. We said nope and got our happy little asses out of there immediately. It took us maybe 10 minutes to douse that fire, pack our blankets, and speed away. And the noises were continuing the entire time. That night, I was obviously pretty shaken up. Before I could fall asleep again, my Navajo mother came and sat by me and said that she could tell I had a rough day. We hadn't mentioned the creepy stuff to avoid a lecture about messing with spirits. She asked me about it, and I ended up spilling my guts about not seeing that canyon ruins. It was something personal that felt like it I wanted to go there, so why couldn't I? It would have been beautiful. After I told her all about it, I could see that she had a really concerned look on her face. What is it? I asked, totally confused. And she explained something I had no idea about, the spirits and the ruins like to lure people up. When they get up on the ground, the spirits push them off. That's why we don't go there. I remained creeped out for the remainder of the visit. The town has a public access kiva, kind of a tourist trap for a little potent place, but since I didn't see the ruins up close, I went down into the kiva, and I went alone as, of course, my superstitious family refused to enter other natives' dwellings. I figured that nothing could push me off a cliff if I was in a kiva. I was right, but something even worse happened. Fast forward to a few weeks later. I worked a shitty call center in Salt Lake City, third shift. It was my first night alone, and I was feeling jumpy ever since the kiva. My brothers already warned me that I had a skinwalker following me, but of course, I didn't believe it. I don't smoke, but I followed my co-workers out for smoke breaks because I'm talkative and I like to chat. Tonight, I lurked in the doorway because I had this horrible cloud of dread hanging over me. I was peeping out the glass door and being a total weirdo. It hit me then how paranoid I had been. That's what skinwalkers do, they mess with your mind. While I was pacing on the front of the glass doors, I decided that this whole thing was stupid, and I was going to go outside and stand there for the rest of my 10 minute break. Most of the smokers were already filing back in, but I walked out and put my hands in my pockets, looked at the sky, looked at the building, mentally patting myself on the back for not being a coward. 
Then I saw something that I will never be able to give a rational or even halfway accountable explanation for. We have like six parking lots. In one of the lots far away from me, maybe 100 feet, I could see something walking. It was a dog, obviously, but it was almost limping and walked like it was tired or hurt. Animal lover me forgot all about skinwalkers, and I started walking toward it, making those come here, doggy noises, and then I stopped abruptly. The dog had the body form of a greyhound, and it was grey, but there was something very, very wrong with it. It had bloody legs and limped, but it walked more like a person would on feet and hands. Its butt was moving to and from, if that makes any sense. When it heard me, it just stopped without turning, something I've never known any dog to do, and finally, it looked over its shoulder at me. And this is the freaky part, this dog was looking at me the way a person does. It had huge eyes, way too big for a greyhound, and its teeth were bared like it was considering biting me. Then it growled, but it was like a whistle growl noises no regular animals make. It almost sounded like it wanted to talk to me or was taunting me somehow. In the middle of all this, I realized that it didn't have a tail, and I'd heard from all the Navajo stories that skinwalkers, when they appear as animals, don't have tails. Forgetting all logic and rationale, I turned and jetted. I didn't look back until I was back inside the building and had pulled the door shut behind me. And by then, when I looked, of course, the thing was gone. When I described this to my brothers, they were absolutely sure it was a skinwalker, and they went through the trouble of blessing me, my apartment, and their apartments. I never saw the creepy bloody dog again, and I have never even slightly wanted to visit the cliff ruins. I've been seeing what I call werewolves pretty much since I've been little and I've had encounters with them ever since then too. Nothing really ever happens with them, we just look at each other, and they end up going about their business. But I did have one terrible encounter, and it was the most horrible and terrifying thing that I've ever encountered. It was when I was truck driving in Ohio. I still have nightmares about it, actually. I parked my shipper receiver one night. I dropped my trailer I'd been pulling because it takes a while for them to unload and load my trailer. I got there the evening before I was supposed to be there. I dropped the trailer and pulled out from under it and parked away from it, just on the other side of this dirt parking lot. This place is kind of near the woods, and not many people live around here. There's actually a lot of woods around it. I pulled my front curtains in my cab and left my truck running and cooked some food for me and my pit bull. He always comes with me, he's my baby boy. After we ate, it was getting dark, and I took him for a walk before we'd settle in for the night. That's when I would go play some modern warfare with my squad. My boy was acting kind of weird, though, looking all around and sniffing, not really like him at all. It was like he was in serious protective mode when we were walking around those woods. It was way too quiet where we were too, no bugs, nothing making any kind of noise. He finally settled down, and we went back to my truck, and I got on my Xbox. A few hours later, he starts acting very protective again and starts growling at the side of the truck where I was sitting, which would be the passenger side. I just thought I made him mad or something. So I started loving on him, but he wouldn't stop growling and staring at that side of the truck. So I decided to take off my headset and listen, and that's when I could hear the unmistakable sound of something outside walking around by me. It sounded big and it sounded really close to the area of the truck that I was in. Then out of nowhere, I heard this deep guttural growl. It sounded off right next to the door, and then the truck rocked back and forth. Our trucks are heavy and it takes a lot to rock the truck side to side, but this thing rocked my truck nonetheless. I'm gonna admit I started to freak out a little bit. My boy jumped into my lap to protect me. I mean, his hair was up, he was growling. He scared the hell out of me, he's never done that before. It was a very serious, tense moment, but it was also a huge comfort to know that he was so protective over me. I finally got up because something told me to just check my doors. I needed to make sure they were locked, 
So I started with the passenger side since that's where I was at. I pulled the curtain back to take a peek, and I looked down at the side of my cab. I still regret looking down there to this day. There was this huge, bulky, tall werewolf, and it had these glowing red eyes. I'll never forget the way it looked when it was beside the truck. It was around 8 feet tall and had a very muscular body like a bodybuilder. It had long hairy arms with human-like hands and these razor-sharp claws at the end of them. If you've ever seen the movie Bad Moon, it looked almost exactly like that, but it had very dark brown or black hair instead of gray, and it had those red eyes that just seemed to glow in the night. And just looking into them, you could tell that it wanted to harm me. It was something that I want to forget. It's something that I wish I could still forget, and I wish I never would have seen. I mean, I was frozen in place by looking into his eyes and so damn scared down to my very soul. Like I said, I've been seeing creatures like this in my whole life, but none like this. This one was different than the rest. This one was evil and it was dangerous, and I really think it wanted to kill me. I knew that I might lose my life that night. My dog attacked the side of the truck, and it seemed to snap me out of my fear. My mind was racing billions of thoughts a second, I really couldn't focus. But I went to look back and realized that my door was not locked and the curtain was still open, and it looked like this thing was reaching for the damn handle. I freaked out and slammed the door lock button, it locked, and about the same time, this creature started pulling the handle, and it wouldn't open, thank god. When it realized the door was locked, it seemed to piss it off. I mean, seriously piss this thing off. It let out this awful howl that was so loud and terrible that I could feel it vibrating inside of my bones. It freaked me out even more, and I was laying down on the floor, crying and praying for my life. Then my guardian angel, my dog, my boy, he's down on the floor nudging me, licking me, whining, telling me that it's okay that he was scared too, and we just needed to get the hell out of there. I came back to my senses, I jumped in the driver's seat and ripped down the curtains. I slammed the stick shift into gear and tried to get away, but I forgot I had the parking brake on. I slammed it in and started to drive off. I finally hit the road and then turned onto the main street and almost wrecked because I was going way too fast. From where we were, there was this field that was about the size of a football field. That was from the warehouse to the road. I looked through the field, and from there where we were, I saw that werewolf still standing there, and then he took off running on his back two legs, and within just a few seconds, he was right there almost to the road. He ran with his arms stretched out and his very big teeth showing like he was smiling and chasing his prey. About that time, he leapt towards the truck. Now I'm doing at least 45 to 50 miles per hour and it looked like he was about to jump right on the truck, but he missed it and he hit the other side of the road. Instantly though, it jumped back on two legs and back under the road and chased me for about another 10 seconds or so, and then it just stopped. I never stopped though, I just kept going, speeding down the road until I could get the truck about 30 miles away. When I got there, I found a place to park and jumped in the back. My mind wouldn't rest though. It was trying to tell me that this was not real and that it didn't just happen. But it did just happen, and it was real. I just grabbed my dog and snuggled up with him the rest of the night. I managed to fall asleep, but all I could think about and dream about was that werewolf and that it might have been my last night alive. I kept this a secret from everyone, including my mom and my wife, for a very long time, and when I finally told them, it was like this weight had been lifted. They both cried because they knew that very well might have been my last night alive, and they were definitely happy that it wasn't. So be careful out there in this world. These creatures are out there, some mean you harm and some don't. Just don't ever go looking for them, and if you do cross paths with them, just be careful, really, really careful, and always be on the Lord. I know so many people may doubt the story, but it's my true story. Believe it or not, it doesn't matter to me, I just want you guys out there to always stay safe and alert. Few years ago, during the middle of the night, 
Five convicts all serving life sentences escaped Westbrook Penitentiary in Nova Scotia, Canada. Michael Smith, age 27, Jake Thompson, age 32, Sam Johnson, age 36, George Miller, age 29, and Lawrence Rogers, aged 41, made their daring escape. While making their escape, they stumbled upon an abandoned farm, or so they thought, 20 kilometers away from the penitentiary. Two days later, two of the convicts told the warden the gruesome details of what happened to them at that farm. This is a story as told by one of the convicts, Michael Smith. I and the boys had been planning our escape for months. Our plan was to make it down to the United States if we could, where no one would know who we are. We knew we had to get as far away from here as possible. We made our escape in the middle of the night, about 2 a.m., I think. Once making it past the walls, we started running north and planned to turn west once we made it past the Memramcook River. I'm not sure how far we ran or for how long, but the sun was rising as a farm came into view. We were tired, hungry, and thirsty and figured we'd run far enough away that we could take a break for a while. When we got close to the farm, I could see it looked old and decaying, like it hadn't been used in years. The house looked dirty, and the bushes surrounding it were overgrown. The barn looked like it was going to crumble in on itself. We weren't sure if anyone still lived there, so we approached the house slowly and carefully. As we got within a few meters of the house, we decided three of us would go to the back door in case people in the house decided to try and run out the back, and the other two would knock on the front door to see if anyone was home. If there were people there, our plan was to tie them up so we could get something to eat and drink before we continued running. I went to the back door with two of the other boys and stood there waiting to see if anyone came running out the door. A few minutes went by when the door suddenly opened, and it was Jake. He said there was no one in the house, so the rest of us went inside so we could start looking for some food and something to drink. The inside of the house was as bad as the outside. It was filthy and smelled musty. It looked like some wild animals had been living there for some time. We hunted around for some food, and all we could find were several cans of meat and beans. The faucet inside the house didn't work, so Jake told Sam to go outside to see if there was a well nearby. Ten minutes went by before we heard Sam yelling, get out here now. We all took off running out the back door. Once outside, we heard Sam again, I'm in the barn, get in here now. As we ran towards the barn, we could see the barn doors were slightly open. Before going inside, we paused for a moment, looking at each other, not knowing what to expect. We were already jittery and on edge. I was the first one inside the barn, which was somewhat dark. As I stepped inside and my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I could see Sam in front of me with a strange look on his face. I then happened to notice out of the corner of my eye what appeared to be a man a couple of meters away from Sam. I looked over to his direction and could see it was, in fact, a man. He was standing there staring at me. He had long silver hair that went past his shoulders and looked to be about 60 years of age. As the rest of the boys came in behind me, they stopped dead in their tracks as well when they saw the man. We stood there looking at both Sam and the man for a bit before Jake spoke up and asked, Who are you, old man? Do you live here? The man didn't answer, he just continued staring at me without uttering a word. A minute went by before Jake again asked the man who he was and if he lived there, this time more sternly. Another minute went by before the old man slowly turned his head so he was now looking at Jake and responded in a calm, confident voice, I do live here and have for a long time. I noticed the old man had a slight accent that I couldn't quite place at the moment. Jake then said, Sam, George, grab that chair over there and find some rope to tie up the old man. They both knew Jake's temper well, so they wasted no time in grabbing a chair that was nearby and finding some bailing twine. As they grabbed and tied the old man to the chair, he didn't fight back or say anything. He continued staring at Jake with an expressionless look on his face. It was an ache that went through me, something was not right about this man. I thought back to my childhood, 
remembering how my father was, and spotting evil had become second nature to me. I kept my thoughts to myself, though, showing weakness in front of the boys was not something I was going to do. Jake then instructed Sam to go grab the canned food we'd found in the house and asked him if he'd found a well with water in it, to which Sam replied he had. As Sam left, Jake turned his gaze towards the old man and asked, What's your story, old man? How do you live in a hellhole like this? The old man didn't respond at first, he just sat there glaring at Jake. When he finally spoke, he said, Let me tell you gentlemen a story, since it looks like I might be here for a spell. I was born a very long time ago in a small village in France. When I was a young man, about your age, something terrible happened to me. It has led me to be unable to die since. I no longer fear death, I long for it. Each day that passes is one more day I must remain on this godforsaken earth. Judging by your tired gentleman, I can see where you came from. I do not care what your business is or what plans you have, I only ask you leave before nightfall. Right then, Sam startled as he walked in with the canned food and a bucket of water. We all jumped a little, and Jake made light of the situation, saying, crazy old man, Sam, bring me the food and water. What the old man said and the way he said it frightened me. This was not the way a crazy person talks or behaves. I looked over at the old man, who then lowered his head and was quiet. We then went and sat down in an area of the barn that was light enough for us to see when we ate. As we sat, we passed around the cans of food, sharing what little we had. The rest of the boys made light-hearted conversation about what their plans were when we made it to America, but I couldn't shake the unnerving feeling this old man was dangerous. After we finished eating, Jake said, someone needs to go take first watch on the loft, the area surrounding us is wide open for several kilometers, so it would be best to travel by night so we don't get spotted. We crossed several rivers on the way here and went upstream a ways before going back on land, so it should take the dogs a while to find our scent. George then said he'd take first watch as the rest of us went to different parts of the barn to try and get comfortable so we could get some sleep. The next thing I remember was being awakened by Lawrence shaking me, saying it was my turn to watch, as he had just finished, which meant I'd been asleep for several hours. As I made my way to the loft, I looked over at the old man, he was glaring at me again with an expressionless look on his face. He didn't seem to be at all worried that five escaped convicts had tied him to a chair with no idea of what could happen next. When I made it to the loft and looked outside through one of the windows, I could see it was getting to be late afternoon, which meant we'd be leaving in a few hours. I wondered what Jake had in mind for the old man before we left. I sat down on a barrel the other boys had been using to watch from and drifted off into my thoughts when suddenly I startled myself awake as I'd fallen asleep. I jumped off the barrel and noticed it was almost dusk. I hurried down the ladder to see if the boys were still asleep, which they had to be, otherwise, they'd have woken me up by now for sure. As I got down off the ladder and looked in the old man's direction, I couldn't believe what I saw, he was just gone. I ran over to the chair to check and could see the bailing twine we'd used to tie him up was ripped to shreds lying on the ground. I yelled to the boys to wake up and come quick. Within seconds, they all came running over to my side and were as unnerved as I was. Lawrence and George had tied him up well, and he didn't look strong enough to rip through the bailing twine. The barn was quickly getting dark inside, so I asked Jake what we should do now, when suddenly we heard a noise coming from one of the rooms in the back of the barn. Lawrence spoke up and said, Jake, let's get out of here. It's hard to see in here, and we need to leave anyway. I'm not leaving without giving the old man a proper goodbye, if you know what I mean. He knows we're escaped convicts, that's got to be him back there in one of those rooms. If you guys are too scared to go back there to get him with me, then just wait here, said Jake. Fine, but hurry the hell up, I responded. Jake started slowly walking to the back of the barn. There were at least three rooms in the back and several stables. Jake always acted like a tough guy, but deep down, I thought he was a coward. The four of us watched as Jake disappeared into the darkness. 
It was getting hard to see in the barn, except for a sliver of moonlight from the rising moon that was starting to come down through the cracks in the old wood. At that point, I was sweating and shaking so badly with fear I thought I might pass out, when suddenly, I heard something let out a growl as Jake screamed out, you son of a. Then he was cut off. The four of us wasted no time in moving to get the hell out of there. We turned and ran towards the barn doors, which were a few meters behind us. When we hit the doors and tried pushing them open, they wouldn't open. We fumbled around for a bit trying to figure out why we couldn't open the doors when we found out why, someone had put a chain through the doors with a padlock on it, locking us in. Oh hell, what are we going to do now? Asked George. Find a way out, come on, we need to get out of here now. Let's see if we can find somewhere we can squeeze through, I responded. We started feeling our way along the barn wall, trying to see if we could find an opening, when I heard what sounded like another growl, then something on four legs running fast towards us. I shouted out, what is that? Suddenly, and without warning, Lawrence let out a blood-curdling scream and cried out, help, something's got me. He continued screaming when suddenly it was as if something ripped out his throat, and the screaming immediately stopped. George then yelled, come on, Johnny, let's get the hell out of here now. I didn't say anything, I just started to run away from Lawrence's screams as fast as I could. As I ran through that dark barn, I kept running into things, almost knocking myself out several times. When I came to what I thought was the back of the barn, I turned around and stood there, trying to catch my breath. As I stood there, I noticed it was dead silent, nothing was moving or making noise. It was as if the world had come to a halt. A few minutes went by when I heard someone whisper, Johnny, is that you? It's me, Jake, I think I found a way out of here, come here. I immediately stiffened up and froze. I thought to myself, I heard Jake scream something awful could he still be alive? Then again, I heard someone whispering from the dark, come on, Johnny, get over here. I wasn't sure what to do, but I knew I didn't want to stand there waiting to be next. I slowly started creeping towards the sound of Jake's voice, when I heard Lawrence's blood-curdling screams coming from the loft area. I started moving faster towards Jake's voice, when suddenly I stumbled upon something lying on the floor. It made a grunting sound, which made me jump back. Johnny, it's me, Jake, help me up. I reached down to help Jake up when my hand touched a pool of warm liquid on the ground. I put my hand up to my nose and could smell the distinct smell of blood. I fumbled around a bit more until I found Jake's arm and helped him up off the barn floor. It was then I noticed the light from the moon coming in, and could see the way out Jake had said he'd found. We hurried as fast as we could, Jake was torn up badly and bleeding. When we got to the hole the light was coming through, I pushed on the barn's paneling, and it opened up just enough that we could fit through. Once outside, we started heading back the way we'd come. I couldn't stop looking over my shoulder as I helped Jake along, thinking we were for sure next. We continued walking all night to try and get as far away from the farm as possible. When it got light enough, we found a busy road to try and get some help. It didn't take long for people to figure out we were escaped convicts, and then we were picked up by the police. I thought Jake was going to die sometime during the night, but the tough bastard held on. After Michael Smith told his story to the warden, the warden informed the local police, who then went to investigate the farm. When they went inside the barn, several of the officers mentioned that it smelled like an animal's den. While searching the barn, they found the old man on the loft, sitting in a chair reading a book. When asked who he was, his response was calm and collected. What took you so long? He was placed under arrest for the suspected murders of Sam Johnson, George Miller, and Lawrence Rogers. As the search in the barn continued, they found a hidden room under one of the rooms, containing the bones of several dozen people, including Sam and Lawrence. The bones had been picked clean, except for some fairly fresh tissue that still covered them. Over the next month, a thorough search of the entire premises was conducted. There was never an exact count of how many bodies they found, 
but they suspected as many as 100 different bodies may have been discovered on the farm. Unfortunately, George's body or bones were never recovered. The authorities also searched the house, finding many old items dating back to the 1700s, including an old photograph that matched the old man. Experts determined that the photograph dated back to the 1850s and was taken in France. However, no one could ascertain how or when the old man came to live on the farm, as it had been abandoned for 30 years. The old man was sentenced to prison, where he remained until 1984. Then, one summer day in 1984, he vanished from his cell. A search was organized, but he was never found. In the years that followed, another family purchased the land where the farm was located. They reported sightings of a strange older man walking around the outskirts of the farm, sometimes just standing there staring before disappearing back into the trees. The old man never gave his name to the authorities, so his nickname became the old man. When the warden asked the old man if the story Michael Smith told was true, the old man simply replied, I don't deny it. As for Michael's fellow escapee, Jake, he survived his injuries but needed to have his left arm amputated due to the severe damage it suffered. His account corroborated with Michael's story. When the warden asked Michael what he thought killed the other men, Michael's response was hauntingly simple, a werewolf. The case of the old man and the mysterious farm remains one of the eerie and unexplained incidents in local folklore, leaving many questions unanswered and shrouded in mystery. Not a horror story as such but just a really weird situation. I'm in Australia, so this is a gum tree, aka our version of Craigslist, story. A few months back I get a phone call from a random older man, who is clearly very 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 drunk and he's asking for me by name, full name, and talking about how his mom had bought something off me probably 10 years ago. It was creepy because he's telling me about where I live and telling me how I looked then, that he had driven his mum to my place to pick up whatever the heck it was that I had sold. I have absolutely no recollection of it. I didn't hang up because I was so off put by this random person saying this stuff and it was just so weird. He must have realized that he was creeping me out a bit and he apologized and that's when he's explained that his mom had passed away and he's going through her address book and came across my name and number and it reminded him of the times he used to take her places. I have bought a lot, sold some, on gum tree over the years and have never felt worried about going to someone's home or having someone come here. Until this phone call. But when he finally put some context into the call, it eased my mind. It was just an older bloke grieving for his mom. Actual Craigslist horror story. I was 19 years old at the time, needing a roommate as my ex had just moved out. I posted an ad on Craigslist and received a reply within a day. Desperate to make rent, I invited the guy over to check out the house. The next day, he showed up with his dad, and everything seemed fine. He liked my Star Wars action figure collection, and his dad mentioned he would be paying rent because Rick, 25 years old, was going to be in college. I thought, great. I don't have to worry about this college kid missing rent. So, I drew up a sublet contract and emailed it to them. About a week later, he moved his bed and dresser in and his dad made the first rent payment on time. Everything seemed well initially. However, over the course of a few months, things started to take a bizarre turn. In the second month, rent came due, and the dad was late, claiming I didn't inform him it was needed by the second, even though it was in the contract. I ended up paying out of my pocket. Meanwhile, Rick began complimenting me on my appearance daily, only to follow it up with I'm not gay though. He had a girlfriend who lived on the other side of the country. One day, after I took a shower, I found evidence of his activities in the form of cum on the shower floor. When I confronted him, he claimed, I don't masturbate, I have a girlfriend. It was bewildering. In the third month, rent was late again, with the same excuse from the dad. 
I showed him last month's texts, but he got indignant and didn't reply. Once again, I paid out of my pocket, and he paid on the 6th. I warned him that if it happened again, we'd have to discuss Rick moving out. Rick got a job at a pizza place down the street, seemingly avoiding attending any classes. His truck was constantly filled with old coffee makers, and he inexplicably practiced parkour, leaving shoe marks on the walls. Arguments erupted about small matters, such as him neglecting chores. I discovered he had been playing with my Star Wars collectibles in his room. His girlfriend visited, leaving her dog behind. The bathroom and my clippers were adorned with his pubic hair, creating an unpleasant situation. In the fourth month, predictably, the dad was late with rent again. I insisted that Rick move out, but the dad claimed I would have to take him to court first. Rick increasingly used my PlayStation and TV, leading to me placing a child lock on it. When he discovered this, he wanted to physically fight me over it, but I refrained. A few days later, I found a letter from his probation officer on the coffee table. I paid for a background check and learned he had prior convictions for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. I called his dad, insisting he leave the next day. The dad laughed it off, so I mentioned having Rick's probation officer's number and the recent threat of physical violence. When I returned home from work that day, Rick and his belongings were gone, leaving what he owed for rent that month. Despite the tumult, the dog he left behind turned out to be a sweetheart. Nevertheless, the experience taught me a valuable lesson. Never get a roommate on Craigslist. Our house was for sale and suddenly appeared on Craigslist for rent by an unknown person. We had people showing up at random hours, asking to see the house, and driving by. They would then call our realtor, wanting to know rental information. It turns out it was a ring of people who would pretend to rent property and take their money. When people showed up to move in, they discovered that what they thought was their new home was already lived in. We had to file a police report and post signs on our doors, notifying people that our home was for sale and the rental listing was a scam. Hi everyone. I have been reading this thread for a while and finally decided to post. This occurred in September of 2007 when I was a sophomore at a Washington DC university. We were coming back to school for the fall, and I had just moved into my dorm. I met a neighbor named Trish and her dad, who was helping her move in. As a super broke student at a very elite private university, I realized that I was missing a few essentials for my room and decided to check Craigslist for free or cheap items. While scrolling, I noticed someone offering free haircuts. Glancing back in the mirror, I immediately thought, damn, I need a haircut. I messaged the post, and they got back to me super quickly, within minutes. The person explained that they needed to style models for their school portfolio and asked me to meet at a hotel later that day. Excitedly, I shared this find with my friend Trish. However, her face fell, and she said, no way can you do this. You don't know this person. If they are really looking for models, why can't they come here, etc., I agreed, realizing she was right. At that moment, Trish's dad walked in, and after being briefed on the situation, he said, I know you're not my kid, but if you were, I would never let you go see this guy. Taken aback by their concern, I sullenly agreed not to go to the appointment. When I went to show them the posting, it was gone. Looking back, I can't believe my lack of common sense. Clearly, this post targeted women who don't have much, and maybe those women's disappearances would go unnoticed for a while. I was definitely looking to get myself a free haircut, but Trish and her dad saved me. It gives me chills to think what could have happened if I had gone. So, to the guy who may have harmed me in a Washington hotel, let's not meet. Housemate actually is a violent psychopath. Bit of a long one but here it goes. So about 6 years ago, 
Me and my boyfriend lived in a shared house in the UK. It was three stories high, we were on the top floor in a double room with a sofa in the room and en suite, and we also had a small area with a kettle or fridge or microwave so we could prepare snacks and small meals up there, and a Juliet balcony that overlooked the garden. The middle floor had one large and one medium room, and the bathroom. Downstairs was a large bedroom and toilet, and the communal kitchen with the washer and dryer, and a small patio garden. Generally the people that lived there were younger professional people, say age 20 to 30 years old, usually couples in the large rooms. Everyone there was friendly and laid back, some issues with it being a bit dirty but we would all chat together and it was all reasonably cool. The landlady initially used a letting agent to advertise and manage the property, but then they said that they would start charging her the fees as opposed to the tenants. She was stingy, so decided to advertise it herself, I assume on sites like Craigslist or Spare Room. So when the smaller room on the middle floor became available, that was the first one she rented out without doing the proper background checks. The first dude she got was a laid-back quiet Jamaican guy, he was only there for about a month and skipped out without paying her rent. The second man she got to rent the room was in his 50s, bald, short and fat, and his name was Al. The landlady let us know that he was moving in via email, as she did with any new tenants. So he moved in one day when I was at work. I got home at about 7, and he was standing in the kitchen with all of the lights off. Bear in mind, this was England in the winter, and it was already dark. I almost shit myself when I walked in and he was just stood there. I introduced myself, and got an off vibe from him. His voice was completely monotone and he did not blink once in the two-minute interaction, I kid you not. It unnerved me so much that I had a microwave meal instead of standing and cooking in the kitchen with him there. The next morning at about 5.30, me and my boyfriend were asleep in bed as were all other tenants and we heard a blood-curdling scream, followed by cunts, you bastards have stole my sock. Then the sound of him stomping up and down the stairs, and a massive bang and a crash come from the kitchen. The banging and incoherent shouting and ranting continued for about 10 minutes, then he returned to his bedroom and the door clicked locked. When it was time for us all to get up, all of the other housemates, two other couples, were creeping around quietly, and we discovered that he had smashed the doors off all the kitchen cupboards. We called the landlady and told her what happened, and she said she would sort it out, and send the maintenance guy over to see the damage. We all then went off to work, and later that day we got an email from the landlady saying that he wasn't going to be living there anymore, and would be out by the end of the week. When talking to the other tenants in passing, we were all relieved that he was going. However, he did not leave. The dude didn't come out of his room for about four days apart from to use the bathroom, and to grab a few bits of food from the kitchen, I saw him when I was in the garden smoking a few times. The landlady then rescinded her last email, saying that he had nowhere else to go so would now be staying. Great. She also said that he was going to apologize, and that made it all better. He shuffled on up to all of our rooms, did a weird apology where he only looked at my feet, and again didn't blink at all. Over the next few months, Al was so creepy. He would corner you and always make really creepy remarks and jokes, and always would over-reveal weird things about him randomly talking about his foot fetish and how he had never had a proper girlfriend to sexually explore with, and would come and sit with me and my boyfriend if we were sat together outside, sitting overly close. You would also hear him creeping around constantly, he would sneak up the stairs to our top floor, stand at the door then creep back down. If we would order takeaway, we would have to wait outside for it, as there were several occasions when he would take people's food, and it would be touched. The girl from the downstairs room next to the kitchen said that he would loudly masturbate in the downstairs toilet next to her room, and then leave jizz in the sink. However, he still refused to leave, and the landlady started the process for an eviction. Then came a day in April, when it was nice and sunny. Me and the boyfriend had both got the day off, and were watching TV with the balcony doors open. The neighbors were Polish family and were doing some DIY in their house, 
I think making some shelves for a bedroom, as you could see them sawing in the garden, and hear some drilling and hammering in the house. This went on for about 30 minutes, and we could hear all shouting downstairs in his bedroom shut up, shut up, I'm trying to sleep, I hate you and other general ramblings. We then heard his door slam, so I immediately got up to lock our door. Next thing you know, he was in the garden with one of my huge kitchen knives, trying to hack through the fence and screaming you polish CNTS, I'm going to slit your throats and make your kids watch I'm going to cut of your wife's head. I genuinely believed that he would stab these people if he could. I called the police while my boyfriend recorded him on the iPad. After about two minutes of this, he threw the knife on the floor and stormed into the house, and locked himself in his room. The police arrived about five minutes later, and the man from the couple downstairs let them in. They went up to his room, and arrested him, and he started screaming and raving that it was a conspiracy, that we were all out to get him and that he would kill us if he ever saw us again. He was remanded into custody for eight months before his trial went to court, because apparently he constantly tried to attack the custody officer and shed everywhere. I found this out when I went to give evidence at his trial, but it didn't take place as his legal funding had been withdrawn. I'm so relieved that I didn't have to see him in the courtroom, and hope I never see him again. This happened to me while I was living in a university town. I had only a semester left while my friends had two semesters left in school. So I rented a room in house with two guys I found on Craigslist. I know that sounds creepy, but that's not the creepy part. I went for a run one morning, came back to my house, and hopped in the shower. With shampoo in my hair, I heard banging noises coming from the front door. I figured that my two roommates, who were friends with each other, had friends coming over and didn't think anything of it at first. I continued my shower, but the banging didn't stop. It continued to get louder. I started to hurry things along and started to become concerned. By the end of my shower, I heard a big crashing sound. Quickly toweling myself off to go investigate, the door to my bathroom opened. In the doorway was a man I had never seen before. He was looking my naked body up and down while I desperately covered myself up. I asked the only question that came to mind, who are you? He didn't answer. He continued to look at me like I was a piece of meat. I asked the next most logical question, are you here by yourself? Another man silently peeked his head from around the corner of the hallway. The first man told me to get on the ground. I said no, and he hit me open palmed in the face. He then said, bitch do you want to die? I had never been hit before. During the recoil, after his hand connected with my face, time had slowed down. During that split second, I experienced the most intense fear in not knowing what to do next. Not knowing what to do to safely get myself out of this situation. Where were my roommates? I was in this alone. I must act alone. My cell phone was in my bedroom. My only plan was to get out of the bathroom, to get my phone. I tried leaving the bathroom and this is where my memory fades and has only been filled in with what others told me. My roommates were home. They came out of their rooms when they heard me screaming no, no, no. The first man had his arms around my waist from behind. When the man saw my roommates, he let go of me. The man demanded that my roommates give back his money. My roommates told the man, we don't have your money. The two men left out the front door. This is where my memory begins again. I fell to the ground sobbing uncontrollably. My memory of this is actually from above, looking down at myself, like a bird's eye view. My face into floor, curled up like a bug. Once I regained control of my body, I went into my room and called my mom. I could barely get the story out to her by the time the police came. I had to throw on some clothes and talk to them outside. The banging and crashing noises were the two men kicking the original 1920s door and have to gain entry. It only took them a few minutes. I told the police what I remembered which was minimal. They took DNA from face and fingerprints from my bathroom door. The police said they would do their best, 
but it was the 50th home invasion that day. It wasn't even noon. Now, 10 years later, this is still difficult for me to talk about. Memories of this day have come back to me like a bolt of lightning throughout the years. Some are still buried. For example, it took me 7 years to remember I went running that day, the reason I was in the shower to begin with. Not me, but my buddy was trying to sell a fish tank. Some guy called about it, and my buddy offered that the buyer can come take a look at it at his apartment, because he didn't feel like loading it up. The guy shows up, and it's a 65 plus year old man that seemingly doesn't take much interest in the actual fish tank, but rather kept making conversation about other stuff around my buddy's house, and eventually starts asking my buddy personal questions. Apparently he seemed like a weirdo but was nice enough. Eventually my friend asked him if he wanted the fish tank or not, he's gotta go because he has to go to work. The guy says he doesn't even want a fish tank, but instead was just looking for companionship in disguise of looking at items for sale. My buddy said he felt sorry for him, but basically told him hey, sorry man, but that's not cool blah 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 time to get the f out. Then the old man was like, you gay, man? My buddy says no, no I'm not, WTF? The old man then says that he should open his mind a little and not be so uptight, and that he, the old man, used to be gay 20 years ago, but stopped when he found out he had HIV, but decided he wanted to get back into the gay stuff. By now my buddy was super uncomfortable and flat out told the guy to get the F out, now. Guy responds by saying come on man, it's not transmitted if you use a condom. My buddy said leave now or I'm calling the cops, and the guy finally walks out the door. As he's walking away, old guy is like last chance man, you sure you don't want to at least try it? My buddy just slams the door shut. Guy leaves. That wasn't the end of it though. Guy kept calling my buddy, leaving weird messages and even showed up at his house again a couple times while my buddy was at work, according to his neighbor. Finally the old man stopped. I don't think my buddy ever called the cops, but was pretty creepy nonetheless. Story time. My name is Andrew, and I've served in both the National Guard and Special Forces for over a decade. Throughout my career, I've faced countless challenges and dangers, one such ordeal I experienced in the remote forests of the Appalachians. It all started when our unit received a distress call about strange disappearances of locals in a secluded area of the forest. The local authorities were baffled, and rumors of a quote cryptid creature roaming the woods spread like wildfire. As part of a specialized team, it was our duty to investigate and neutralize any potential threat. Incognito, and with government blessing. Our mission began with a sense of excitement mixed with apprehension. We were seasoned veterans, accustomed to handling high-stakes situations, but the unknown always carried an extra layer of tension. Our squad consisted of skilled soldiers, each with their own expertise and combat experience. The forest was dense and eerily quiet as we ventured deeper into its heart. The canopy overhead blocked out most of the sunlight, casting eerie shadows on the forest floor. It was easy to believe that something sinister lurked in the darkness, watching our every move. As night fell, we set up camp and prepared for what lay ahead. That's when we first encountered the creature. It emerged from the shadows, its eyes glowing with an eerie light. It stood on two legs like a massive, muscular wolf, its fur bristling with primal energy. It was a dogman, a definitely live creature. It added to our camp so we acted swiftly, weapons at the ready. But the creature was faster and more agile than anything we'd faced before. It seemed to possess an uncanny intelligence, evading our bullets and hiding in shadows. In the end, it escaped and we pursued it relentlessly. Determined to eliminate him, if not capture. But we lost him. Damn creature was faster than a four-legged wolf. It was as if the forest itself protected him, shielding it from our efforts to capture or kill it. We stayed for few days, 
searching for tracks or a cave where he lives. Our frustration grew. We were trained to handle human adversaries, not mythical creatures. Doubt crept into our minds. But I refused to give up. I had seen the creature with my own eyes, felt its presence in the depths of the forest. And yes, I was skeptic. In the end, we were forced to withdraw, our mission incomplete. The cryptid remained at large. We made a report to our higher-ups about what we've seen, but they mocked us. Some called it a hoax, others a figment of our imagination. But I know the truth, and I swear by all that is sacred that what we encountered in those dark woods was real. It was New Year's, the last one that had come. My friends and I ventured into a park around 1 a.m. since there were cops on the road, and we didn't want to get caught for drinking or smoking. We headed pretty far in and hid behind a big fallen tree, setting up our picnic rug. We hung out there for a little while until everything became really silent, like dead silent. There were still people further up the road at the lookout we came from, but we couldn't hear them anymore. There was just no noise. My friend pointed out that he could hear a sort of whistling in the trees, almost human-like. When I listened in, I could hear it too. It almost sounded like a human whistling to another human, a few whistles first, and then a response. Not musical whistles either, it almost seemed more like communication. At this point, we decided to leave, all of us getting weird vibes. I should mention there were about five of us that night. We decided to cut further into the park to get back to the main road at the bottom. It's not a big park, at most maybe 2 kilometers in length, so we knew we could reach the road in no time, especially as we were near the bottom. But as we got further down, it became apparent that we were lost. We tried following the path, but it was not maintained, with lots and lots of tall grass making everything confusing. We tried a few offshoots of the path but not one of them led to the tourist road as they were all overgrown. We saw a bus stop down the hill but decided to keep trekking as we could see it was down a nasty embankment. We caught our breath and started off again when my friend, let's call him Baz, and I heard a blood-curdling scream from the trees ahead. It sounded almost like a woman or a little girl screaming at full tilt but had a strange sort of recorded quality. Almost like if you heard it through a speaker or from really far away. Strangely, it sounded close though. Everyone froze, and looks were directed at me, and I just said it was a possum. I have lived in this particular area of the hills for my whole life essentially and have done many night walks. Not once have I heard a possum or an owl make that noise. We continued looking for a way out with no luck, an increasing feeling of dread and fear creeping into our minds. The darkness was thick, thicker than it should be. The moon was almost full, and there was a lot of light that night, but this park seemed extra dark, despite it being very open. At this point, we were all at our wit's end. We followed a path, and we could see the road now, but in our path was the largest holly bush I had ever seen, just rife with spikes. We went back yet again to where we started, and my partner gave me his walking stick for getting through brush. I immediately flipped it around and held it like a bat. We wandered a few more steps, and like a miracle, a car drove past, illuminating the bus stop, clearly less than 10 meters from us. We practically ran out of the bush, scrambling down the embankment and speed walking home. It's worth mentioning, I have since researched Australian nocturnal animals, particularly those in the Dandenong ranges, and am yet to find anything that sounded even close to what we heard. To this day, I'm not entirely sure what was in the bushes. It didn't help that my friend made a skinwalker joke when we first heard the whistling either. Anyway, thank you for reading, and any ideas, supernatural or otherwise, on what was out there would be awesome. When my buddies and I were around 15 or 16 years old, we used to sneak off into the woods to smoke because it was the only place where we wouldn't get caught by our parents. We had this favorite spot right on the edge of the woods behind some cedar trees and a randomly placed chain-link fence. 
It was probably around 10 p.m., and we were all walking to our spot for our late-night smoke ritual when something strange happened. As we approached our spot, we noticed what we initially thought was a white cat. It was in the tall grass directly in front of the entrance to the opening that led to our spot. We kept getting closer, assuming that once it noticed us, it would just run away like most animals do. However, as we got closer, it became clear that this wasn't a cat at all. When we were about 15 feet away, the creature stood up straight on two legs, revealing the same stature as a little human. It even sprinted upright into the opening of the woods, just like a person would do. The only difference was that it was white, so I assumed it was its fur or hair. Needless to say, we all panicked and hightailed it back to the house, yelling, what the F was that thing? The next day, in the daylight, we decided to go back to the spot for a morning smoke. That's when we saw the fence in the woods had chunks of orange fur and bloody flesh stuck to it as if something had been mauled or ripped apart back there. From then on, we always joked about it and referred to it as the skunk ape. It became a topic of conversation every time we hung out, until the sad day when both of the friends who were with me that night passed away. Reading stories and seeing pictures here reminded me of that eerie memory. I grew up in Mesa, Arizona, near a small private airport called Falcon Field. The entire area spanning miles was packed with acres and acres of orange groves before mass development of housing communities. Naturally, as kids, we would run through them and play hide and seek. My father would always warn me, though, about playing in there at night and, of course, discuss what to do if we came across javelina or coyotes. My friend told me this story about her experience in the groves, and it is literally one of the creepiest things I have ever heard, referring to crawlers, and I am curious if anyone in the area has had any similar sightings. There was a patch of orange groves that always gave me the creeps. As an avid runner, I never ran around that area because it made the hair on my arms stand up straight. There was also a temperature change, it just became colder, eerier, and was always dark. It was so dark in that area, in fact, that it was often hard to see even with your eyes adjusted. I always felt like I was being watched, and the streetlights never worked on that stretch of road. The only one that did work was always dimmer than the rest of the surrounding lights and would, from time to time, flicker. It gave me the total creeps, to say the least. My friend, who lived in this area, said that she and her friend ventured into the same area of the creepy groves around 10 p.m. one night. We even joked while she told me this story, why out of all the groves, why did she and her friend choose those groves to play in after dark because everyone knew that the specific area just had a weird ominous vibe. To add even more creepiness, the entire area wasn't managed well and was totally overgrown, so you couldn't see well between the lanes of trees maybe one or two rows in. As bored teenagers go, she said she and her friend were walking through one of the lanes of groves, and they just had the moonlight to guide them. Suddenly, within a minute of walking into the grove, her friend with terrified eyes grabbed her shirt and said, someone is here. And they both bolted for the street. She told me she could hear big heavy footsteps running behind them. They ran until they got to the nearest streetlight, and when they looked back, they saw a tall, over eight feet, pale, thin creature staring at them. They walked backward for a while, staring into the darkness looking at the creature until it ran back into the grove. Then they ran back home. When they finally settled down and caught their breath, she told me she asked her friend how he knew there was someone else there. And he said he saw a massive pale creature in the moonlight lift its torso up from the ground like it had been sleeping in the dirt. All he could do was pull her back by her shirt and run. She said the experience has haunted them for years, and she avoids that area entirely when she goes home to visit her family. Also, years ago, my sister-in-law was driving by that area, and she said that right where they saw the crawler, she saw a man crossing the road, but he didn't look normal. She described him as being very pale, thin, moving fast, and hunched over. 
She thought he was sick or something from his movements, like he was hurt, as it seemed like he was holding his chest. She said that as she drove by, she saw the person disappear behind a parked car, and she was baffled because she said he was very tall and didn't understand how someone so large could just disappear like that behind a small, parked vehicle. My sister-in-law doesn't believe in ghosts and wouldn't have a reason to lie about that experience, but I always knew there was something creepy about that patch of groves. A young child also went missing many years ago in that very same area, sadly. Curious to hear your thoughts on this, and stay out of the groves. For a few years now, I've been hearing and experiencing different phenomena. Every time I go outside to smoke a cigarette on my porch, I feel as if I'm being watched or studied. Anytime I'm walking my dog and I hear my father calling my name, even though I know he isn't outside. I live in a valley between two decently sized mountains, Grafton and Mount Anthony, if that helps any, just on the edge of the Appalachian mountain range. Could this be a crawler, or am I just going insane? It's been going on for, like I said, a few years, and I've noticed activity tends to pick up in the winter. During the spring and summer months, it doesn't feel like I'm being watched but beckoned. I got curious last night and was messing around with my flashlight, one of the adjustable lens ones. I set it to its longest range and saw a pure white figure standing on the other side of the pond. I couldn't see its face, but as soon as it turned its head, I turned off my flashlight and went to bed. I'm in my 20s and live in Washington State. I moved in with my mom in October 2018 when I was 16. She lives in a very small mining town northeast of Seattle, with lots of caves, forests, and spread out houses. There isn't even a school in the town. For reference, she lives with 15 people, and she was staying in the trailer behind the house. I don't want to say why she lives with that many people, but it may be obvious. Anyways, her trailer is maybe 50 feet behind the house, and behind her trailer is a huge field with grass about 5 to 8 feet tall, right next to a big deep forest. Nobody lives or even goes back there. It started with people who lived there saying they have been hearing screams and whistles from the forest and field, and that there's been strange activity going on around the property. One night, me, my mom, her boyfriend, and our two dogs were in the trailer around 11.30 to 12 p.m. We heard a dog barking in the distance, except it sounded weird, like the bark was repeating itself. My stepdad pointed out how it doesn't sound like a dog, but the weirdest part is the dog barked all night until I fell asleep around 4 a.m. Our dogs were also barking at whatever was scratching at the door and when it would get near. We also heard scratches on our trailer, and they had to be scratches of a large animal. We thought maybe a cougar or something, and we banged back and told it to go away, but it stayed around for a while. The scratches would happen frequently, and I always felt watched when I would be outside at night around the trailer. One night, we were at a friend's tent around the corner, and after we left around 11.30, we went up to the convenience store up the road. As we were driving back down the road to our trailer, we both saw a pair of glowing orange eyes staring at the car from the woods next to the house. I stayed behind in the car as my mom and stepdad, her boyfriend, whom we saw at the store and took back to the trailer with us, went to the trailer. I could almost feel eyes on me in the car, so I got out and went inside. The weirdest experience I've had during my stay there was definitely the night I was inside the house, and around 4 a.m., my stepdad came in and told me there was a skinwalker outside. It was calling one of the people's names who lived at the house out in the field, let's call him Fred, and said he wanted to show me because he knows I'm into stuff like this, I knew it was probably a windigo or crawler, not a skinwalker. Keep in mind, they started hearing it as soon as Fred got home from work and came home a few minutes before. Sure enough, I went outside, and out in the field, every minute or so, there was what sounded like a woman's voice yelling Fred? In a scared tone. 
My stepdad mentioned that Fred had a girlfriend who passed away, and this sounded eerily like her but very distorted, and there was a weird sound effect before it would yell out Fred. I almost can't describe it. Well, fast forward 30 minutes or so, and I'm left in the trailer alone. I realized this and really did not want to be out here with whatever this is, so I stepped out to go inside, and I heard something moving around in the field near the trailer. I looked and saw a white head with orange glowing eyes peeking out from the grass, and whatever it was sounded like it was on all fours and was very fast. It watched me walk all the way back into the house. I was creeped out and I'm wondering if this could be a crawler or windigo? I've had more experiences if anyone wants to hear them. Thank you for reading, and I hope to hear back from anyone with some info. So I usually don't really believe in most myths and legends and stuff like that, but something I recently witnessed really made me doubt that. I don't know if I'm just being paranoid but I might have had a very close encounter with something that was most definitely not human and scared me out of my mind. Basically last night I decided to go hang out with a close friend and skateboard around a bit and I met some other friends from school down by a grocery store there. We decided to hang out for a bit, walk around and they told my friend and I that they needed to start walking home and they wanted to show us some apparently cool sketchy treehouse where people always go to hang out and do drugs and what not on the way. We start walking that way mostly through just suburban neighborhoods and at that point it's almost completely dark outside. There were around 7 of us at first and people mostly started heading out until it was just said friend and I and a girl who agreed to take us to see the treehouse since it was fairly close to her house. We walk there and take this pretty open path to a chain link fence with a hole in it. We go through using our phones as flashlights and not far after there's another chain link fence with a hole in it with the treehouse right behind it, surrounded by loose bushes and a small forest. We're pretty scared at that point since it's dark and all that so the friend and the girl stay behind the fence while I go through the hole just outside. After looking at the treehouse for a few seconds we start hearing rustling in the bushes, but although scared dismiss it as a small animal or maybe even one of our friends just messing with us since it's pretty close to several houses. Like an idiot I keep standing outside the small hole in the fence, not moving while the rustling keeps moving around. We called out several times to no response and the thing whatever it was kept moving around in the bushes a little bit, rustling every few seconds. I tried looking and could barely see it but guessed that it was around half my height. It keeps moving and after a bit we realize from the footstep patterns that it started waking on two legs. This just about does it for us and we get out of there looking behind us every couple seconds. On our way back, Said friend told me earlier by the treehouse he had caught a glimpse of something moving of a whitish gray color a bit bigger than a large dog. I visited this treehouse again today with a couple more friends and actually went up this time but gladly we didn't see or hear anything. And yes, I know I'd be the idiot to die in a horror movie. I am a resident of Indiana, about 30 minutes away from Indianapolis. This story is true, and I will try my absolute hardest to answer any questions with specific details. This all happened between June 2022 and September 2022. I know the June part because I have a video of my drunk friend Kyle at the place where this happened, promising to raid a Kona ice truck with me the next day. I do lean more towards September, though because I remember it being kind of cold and one of the last times we were going to be able to go out there that year. My friends Cy and Kyle were fishing at a parks river that was connected to Geist and invited me and my buddy Cody out to fish with them around 8.30 pm we both weren't too keen on fishing, but we went just to chill because we all generally got along well. When we first arrived, they came up and said hi to us and gave a brief explanation of how the night's been so far. The gist was the fishing was shit but the times were good. They also casually mentioned in a joking manner that they heard movement around them, and Kyle said something along the lines of don't worry Sam, I'll take it on with my bare hands. Now it's been two years, 
but I'm like 99% sure he said some cocky remark along those lines. Kyle's the type of guy to say some shit like that. We all brushed it off and thought it was funny and ended up hanging around the campfire for a while. Now, some notable things that happened between now and when I first saw it were. We did throw a dead battery from a light we had into the fire to see what would happen. I don't know if batteries make you see crazy shit, but you know, we did it. I don't think it explains us all seeing the same thing, even if it had some effect on us. Cy drank a beer, and so did Kyle, but not me and Cody, we both are sober people. We didn't catch any fish, which was kind of lame. At around 10 PM, we all were kind of ready to go home because of how dark it had gotten and how bad the fishing was. We were about to start packing. Now, this park has a small trail, and at the end of it is a big open lake. I thought, hey, before we leave for good, we might as well walk to the lake and see it, then walk back to the cars. Everyone generally thought this was a good idea, and we were going to start walking once packed. They were about 80% done packing when I decided I'm gonna start ahead of them a little bit, so I walked about 300 feet down the trail until I saw some huge white thing move from the right side of the path to the left side pretty far down the trail. This honestly scared the shit out of me, but I had no flashlight, and in all honesty, I thought to myself, hey, that seemed creepy as f, but it might have been a deer, and I might just be crazy. So I walked back to the group, and since I was two years younger than Cy and Kyle, I didn't want to mention it lest I get called a pussy, which was pretty much a death sentence for my ego since at the time I was a sophomore. After they finished packing, we all got ready to walk and got a little further down on the trail than I did on my own. And then, with a flashlight shine down the trail, we saw it. Now, this being two years ago, I don't remember everything, but here are some things I do 100% know I saw. It walked on all fours, its joints didn't move when it walked, it had no fur, only pale skin. It was thin, and you could see its spine protruding from its back, the same way you can see someone's ribs when they're malnourished, and it had a short neck with an unidentifiable face. It probably stood about 5 to 6 foot. It walked very fast from one side to the other and genuinely felt evil. I just called Kyle, explained this post, and asked him to do his best to describe it to me. The only thing that differed in his description was it stood on two legs and was a little taller. After calling Kyle, I called Cy and had him do the same. He gave a much deeper description. It walked on four legs but came up once and stood on the back too. It was kind of like the front two legs were arms that it could also walk on. He said the creature was long, said the joints didn't move. He also said it had no feet, kind of a nub, which I 100% remember and agree with. Skin looked like it was stretched over its body to the point you could see bones. Like wearing a shirt that's way too small. After we saw it, we all stood in baffled, frozen in fear. I asked, we all saw that right? And everyone said yes. Cody was behind us, so he didn't see the full thing but he 100% agrees he saw a flash of white and agrees it happened. We immediately turned around and started back to the cars. Cy and I were behind, looking at where we saw it. Kyle and Cody were looking forward, leading us back to where we parked. Once we got out of the wooded trail, Cy said he saw it for a second watching us leave, stating it must have gone into the woods about 30 feet and kept pace with us as we left. I remember getting into my car scared as f, our immediate thought was that we must have seen a skinwalker, but I'm not so sure after all this time. We all 100% believe in what we saw, and after bringing it up to Cody, Kyle, and Cy, we know what happened. I live about 6-7 to seven minutes away from where this happened and am honestly terrified that one day I'll see it again. I'm posting this in a few subreddits looking for answers and thoughts on it and I'll be here to answer any questions you have. Thank you for reading my account of the story. This occurred in 2023 in downtown Colorado Springs. We were exploring tunnels close to a river or close to Fountain Creek open space. 
What is up everyone? So a buddy and I had a pretty strange and utterly terrifying experience. We both enjoy urbexing and discovered a series of underground tunnels or like storm drains, that probably went as far as a mile and a half. Anyway, we made our way to the tunnels, got our flashlights, and my camera. We were just shooting the shit and when we got maybe halfway through, the tunnel narrowed to where we were hunched over instead of being able to fully stand up. We then heard a loud scream that sounded like a lady, but not human. Overall it sounded most like a mountain lion scream or look it up. It's a terrifying sound. After we heard this, we both froze and listened. I was shining my light down the tunnel, where I saw something pale moving towards us. I probably only saw it for like 4 seconds until I broke out of my shock and my buddy and I were running hunched over in these dark tunnels. I didn't have my camera video on, but I dropped it and sure as hell will never go back to retrieve it. I thought I was hallucinating or something, but my friend saw the exact same thing. The creature we saw was unlike anything I've ever seen. It was completely pale and looked sickly or emaciated. The body looked somewhat human, but not quite. The face resembled that of a horse or not as big of a snout though. Really f strange. If I had to compare it to anything, it would be the above image. The face especially looked like that of this particular picture of the Pope Lick monster. It's like if you took the head of the Pope Lick monster photo and placed it on the body of a deer standing on its hind legs. I suck at photo editing, so perhaps someone could photoshop something like this to get a more accurate depiction of the creature? I still get the chills even just thinking about this experience. My friend and I vowed to never explore tunnels again, obviously. I always thought there was no such thing as humanoid creatures until I experienced this. I enjoyed listening to like skinwalker stories, but I always thought they were pure fiction. A deep part of me just wants to know what it is and if it was harmful? Did we escape a potentially deadly situation? Why are not more people seeing these things? There has to be more right? Why does no one have legit photos of humanoids? If you all have an idea of what this could have been or if you've had a similar experience, please share. I am utterly scared and baffled. Update March 18th, 20th 24, Hey everyone. I've been getting a bunch of requests to pin the tunnel we went to and to go back and film. This story is 100% true. I am terrified to go back, but I do want to provide the most proof I possibly can. My buddy and I know what happened. I texted my homie about trying to find the exact location or we've been to so many tunnels and there are a shit ton of tunnels on the same river that goes through Fountain Creek. Okay, this might not actually be crawler related, but I've been seeing crawlers for years and journaling about their activities, so I thought this might still be okay for me to post here. I haven't actually seen the crawlers at all this fall and winter, whereas I've been seeing them every fall or winter for the past three years. So, this new entity. All I could see of it a few nights ago was this warm orange light. For a brief moment, I thought I was seeing a fire in the distance beyond the trees, but then this light moved, and I could see that it was down around my barn in the woods behind it. As I said, there was an orange light. I think I saw a pair of them, so presumably, these are eyes. I couldn't see any of its body, unfortunately, but the way it moved was odd. After watching it down at the barn for a moment, it started to move in the direction I was also moving, to take my dog to his poop spot. It kept pace with me, watching me the whole way from the woods, it was moving parallel to me rather than directly following me. I'm struggling with how to comprehend the way it moves, though. Honestly, my first instinct is that it moves like a bipedal dinosaur that keeps its front half close to the ground. It wasn't as low on the ground as the crawlers, but it wasn't as tall as the possible dogmen. Its movement was also very smooth. Steady? Crawlers bounce around, and the maybe dogmen make enormous footsteps. I'm going to keep looking for it, but in the meantime, has anyone heard of anything similar to this? I'm located in the southeast US in the foothills of the Appalachians. I have seen groups of crawlers, 
something around 10 feet tall that I'm calling maybe dog men, I haven't been able to see them clearly, just silhouette and the echoes of those footsteps that live in my mind. My nephew and his two friends actually saw one, though, and now this entity, which seems to have a much higher tolerance for the cold. Any information, ideas, hypotheses or theories, folklore, or experiences will be immensely appreciated. This happened when I was about 14 years old. My family lived on a farm surrounded by open fields that were dotted here and there by heavily wooded areas. I used to love to go out with my dog in the grounds of the farm, whilst my dad and granddad worked with livestock and machinery, in and out of the various outbuildings that we had. We had a nice neighbor renting one of the converted cottages on site and it was in his yard that I witnessed something I'll never forget. A bit of context, there's a lot of natural and rustic beauty around where my parents' farm was, and healthy populations of wild animals. Rabbits, hares, foxes, deer, badgers, it was always a truly magical place to someone who started out growing up in the city. Anyway, to the main account of what I saw. I was busy attaching my dog's lead to his harness on the road leading around from the front of the house, past my neighbor's house and into open fields once over a cattle grid. Our neighbor was away for the weekend to see friends and I always did a courtesy check of his place while he was away, just, moving mail out of the rain, checking that things looked okay, making sure gates were latched and things. I got around the corner and my blood turned to ice. It was one of those feelings that you know is the most primal, deepest fear that oozes straight out of your soul. In my neighbor's woodshed, was an animal, a creature, a being, that I had no recognition of. It was very thin, with unnaturally long arms, legs, almost like a deer, body compact, limbs long and bony. It was rifling around the stack of wood my neighbor had drying out in the shed from a tree he had recently felled. The being was almost a frog-like texture, with bulbous and unsettling eyes, a pinched mouth with barely any lips, a bloated pot of a stomach but a clear lithe and agile build. It was making these snuffling grunts. Like. Busy noises. It was picking up bits of wood and sniffing at them and seemingly perplexed by the clunk of. The wood when it dropped it back onto the pile. My dog was as still as I was. He was a German pointer so I was used to seeing him make that firm, hunting pose. But he was eerily rigid and hackles were up. My dog eventually let out one of his gruff, half-barks that he usually made when curious or startled by something. At the sound, the being absolutely buckled like it had the shock of its life. It scrabbled around like a big, sloppy spider with its arms and legs grasping for balance. It glanced at us only briefly, made what I could only describe as a gurgly, vomit-like sound and bound away effortlessly over the fence like a deer hardly any effort and it was able to clear quite an impressive fence without coming close to the barbed wire. It ran like a dog with long front legs and short back legs. Almost like a greyhound. It took me a long time to go for a walk confidently again after that, I didn't even know what to call it. It didn't look like anything, it doesn't seem to want anything, and other than being terrified by my encounter, I didn't feel like I was in danger but it was a cryptid in every sense of the word. To this day, I'm not even going to speculate about what it was. But I know I saw something I shouldn't have that day. What was interesting in the great scheme of things, was that there was another farmer who lived a few fields over from us, who was always ridiculed for believing in UFOs and strange beings and things. You'd often hear him spouting on in the pub about green aliens and what have you. But after witnessing that, whatever it was, it always made me wonder if he had seen something too. Until right now I have shared this with maybe four people because it sounds crazy. This happened back in 2001 so the internet wasn't very helpful back then. I lived in Roanoke, Virginia in a wooded area with my family. We lived on a big hill surrounded by only woods. 
I returned home around 2 a.m. and was young teen at the time I parked my car and turned on overhead lamp to roll up a joint. It was a nice night so I had the windows down and would always hear noises but never thought nothing because there were tons of animals around. Anyway I roll up and smoke and also pull out my art pad and start to draw so overhead lamp is still on and had music softly playing for maybe an hour I did this. Finally I was tired and ready to go inside so I reached up and turned off the overhead lamp in the car and when I did I could now obviously see outside the car now and directly in front of me maybe 12 feet slumped down in front of my brother's jeep is this pale, skinny, long-armed and long-legged creature. It was looking right at me like it had been there a while. It was also intelligent enough to know that once I cut that inside lamp off I could now see outside and knew I could see it. I only saw it for maybe 3 seconds until it realized it and it bolted to the back of the house like a cheetah almost. I was scared and stuck in place at what I saw. I was too scared to get out and ended up driving around for hours until the sun came up. I returned home and finally went inside. I immediately the that day tried to rationalize and asked my dad and brother were they outside at 3 am last night to which they laughed and said heck no. That house always scared myself and my brothers. We actually called the cops another time because we thought someone was trying to rob the place because we kept hearing noises on back deck door one night. This sighting I had of that creature was burned in my brain now 2024 so almost 24 years later I'm still curious to what I saw. Even more crazy as years went by in the internet. Became what it is. I remember the first time I came across a pic of the what some call a skinwalker. And my heart stopped. It's that famous pic where it slumped down on all fours in the exact position I saw it in that night. Moves the same way they say and limbs were long just like those stories. It felt good to know I wasn't alone and crazy. But still so many questions. I felt I would share in hopes maybe others have seen this thing and will share. We are not alone on this planet. Are they aliens? Whatever it was it didn't harm me. My window was down the entire time it could have snuck up on me and easily harmed me. It seemed to only watch me. Also it happened so fast to me the face had a small mouth, with big eyes and didn't see a nose. Very very pale though. Thanks for reading. My boyfriend and I were outside last night, watching the stars on a nice, clear, cold winter night, maybe about minus 10 Celsius? We had heard noises in the area before, usually from across the street. It sounded like a big circular saw. It made no sense for someone to be using a circular saw at 1.30 am, but what made even less sense was that the sound came from three different directions. It started at one house. Then 10 seconds later, at the house beside it, and then in the bush behind both, sounded further. Mr. Brave Boy, my boyfriend, went up to the road and yelled, Quai. I told him, are you sure you want to attract something that makes noises like this? We waited in silence. A few moments later, we heard the sawing like screech much closer, and I heard what sounded like bipedal steps. I turned on the headlamp, but I saw nothing. I'm not sure what I was expecting, but I didn't really want to see it. I had this deep sense of unease and just told him we should go back home now. We backtracked to the house and went to bed. So, for starters, I was just trying to fall asleep in my room but couldn't because I felt watched. So, I did what I always do and turned on my phone flashlight. There, by my closet, was a creature. It had long fingers, elongated arms and legs, porcelain-like skin, reflective eyes, and it was so bony, as if its skin had almost no muscle, just laying over bones. This creature was crouched, just staring at me. It wasn't moving, blinking, or even breathing. It just stared. At first, I thought I had been imagining it, so I turned my flashlight off. But when I turned it back on, the creature was still there, staring. So, I turned over and fell asleep. The next night, the thing was in the same place, 
just outside my closet but also by a doll cabinet in my room, doing the same thing as last time. So, I just went to sleep again. After that, I had enough of this entity watching me sleep, so I went to my sister's room and explained to her in more detail what happened. Suddenly, the room went from feeling really safe to just feeling a seething rage from outside the door to my sister's room. We both went quiet, wondering if she could also feel the heavy presence. Eventually, we both decided to go to bed. Then, in the afternoon, my sister made me this little pouch to ward it off, but I insisted I didn't need it. That night, I could feel its presence again, so I snatched that little pouch, and it's been gone ever since. This happened to me around the middle of 2022 near Northern Sydney. I live in an old house that backs onto a national park. While this national park is beautiful, whenever I walk through there, I always have a feeling that I'm being watched or followed. In this national park, there are plenty of Bigfoot built structures, but those are for a whole other story. My house is very old, so the plumbing is very loud and will often wake up other people in the house. So. At about 1.30 am to 2.30 am on the night I had to go to the toilet, I decided to go and pee in my backyard, which overlooks the national park and a small path. As I'm finishing up, I feel a sinister feeling, almost like murderous intent. As I feel this, the hair on my arms and legs starts to stick up, and I feel a shiver down my spine. I'm now looking directly into the national park, and that's when I see this thing. It's about 8 to 9 feet tall, very thin, with long stiff limbs. It's almost emitting a white light, like a glow but not really, and its head is tube-shaped, almost like a long soda can. I freeze up as I see this thing. I'm facing west, and it's walking south. It turns its head to the left and stares at me for what feels like a year, as if it was contemplating what to do, then starts walking directly towards me. I immediately sprint back into my house and lock the back door. I've never seen this thing since, and no one in my area has had any similar experiences. I'm not sure if this is a crawler, but from the descriptions I've read, there are some similarities. Has anyone else seen or experienced something like this? This happened around 5 years ago. I was at home when suddenly I heard a loud crash not far from my house. It was so loud that I felt the ground shake. In front of my house, there is a decent sized patch of woods. It was around dusk, not dark but not light either. As I walked into the woods in the direction of the sound, I felt like something was watching me but saw nothing and heard nothing. A short way in, maybe 100 yards, I found a rather healthy big tree that was knocked over. It was very fresh, and the smell was still in the air. I took some photos and started on my way out. That's when I started to hear something walking behind me. No matter how hard I looked, I saw nothing. I was almost out of the woods when I heard something fall from a tree and hit the ground. It hit so hard that it made the ground shake a little. It charged after me, and I could hear it running. When I got out of the woods, I looked back in and saw absolutely nothing. I thought it was a bear until I started reading about crawlers. At the time, our neighbor was telling us that something was living around his house that would growl at him as he went to work around 6 am some mornings. Could this have been a crawler? I am a 20 year old woman and my husband and I live in Richmond, Virginia, which is where this story takes place. I don't mind revealing where we live as it is important to my story's moral. About two weeks ago we decided that we wanted to get season passes to King's Dominion, which is the biggest amusement park in our state. We were a little short on cash to get the passes and were in between paychecks, so we decided to sell some of our old things on an app called Let Go, which is basically like Craigslist where you can post items you have for sale and it shows it to everyone within a 50 mile radius of your location. The only way let go it is different from Craigslist is that you have to make an account on let go, 
which can be made with your email account or by syncing it to your Facebook. No personal information is given out besides your name, your general area, and a tiny thumbnail or whatever your profile picture is on Facebook. You are also able to chat with other buyers and sellers through a messaging system on the app to keep your phone numbers anonymous. Anyways, I had posted my old tablet on let go to make up for the money we still needed to get the passes and within a few minutes I got a message from a woman named Kisha who was interested in buying my tablet. One thing I noticed about Kisha's account is that it didn't have a thumbnail picture. I brushed it off thinking that she just didn't sync it with her Facebook. This was red flag number one. The conversation with Kisha went as follows. Kisha, hi is the tablet still available? Me, yes, it is. Kisha, great, can I pick it up in two hours when I get off? Me, actually my husband and I are trying to get KD passes today so we can go this evening. I could drop it off to you now if that's okay. Kisha, yeah that works. I work at the McDonald's off 9 Mile Road. Me, okay great. Can you send me the address so I can head over? Kisha, sure. Now, the conversation stopped there for a bit after I had asked Kisha for the address to her McDonald's, since that area has quite a few of them. She didn't respond for a while, which now looking back after everything that happened, should have been a red flag number two. But at the time, I figured she was slow to reply because she told me that she was at work. My husband was with me so I asked him if he knew which one it was and he looked up on Google where McDonald's were on 9 Mile Road and there actually was only one store on that road. I copied the address from Google and messaged her back 10 minutes after hearing nothing new from her asking if this was the right address. Me, hey is it the one at blah 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 9 Mile Road? Kisha, yeah that's it me, okay I will be there in about 20 minutes Kisha. Okay message me when you are here so I can tell my manager I need to run out to my car so I can meet you. Me, alright, see you soon. After that, my husband and I jumped in his truck and drove to the McDonald's that she worked at. We had to take the highway and it was rush hour by the time we got on the highway, so what was supposed to be a 20 minute drive turned out to be a 40 minute drive. The whole time we were driving there Kisha would send me messages saying where are you? She did this about four or five times, and each time I would tell her something along the lines of sorry, traffic is brutal only a few minutes away. We finally got to the McDonald's and parked in the parking lot right in front of the main entrance. My husband suggested that we sit on the bed of his truck, because he didn't want to sketch Kisha out by making her walk up to the window of a stranger's car. I agreed, and we hopped out of his truck and he pulled down the little hitch door to his bed and we sat on it. I then pulled out my phone and messaged Kisha saying hey I'm here. She replied very quickly with okay, what car are you? I told her I was in the big orange truck. We waited for about 5 minutes staring at the door waiting for her to come out and no females walked out of the restaurant. The only person who did walk out was a tall, skinny man on a cell phone who got picked up in a black car that had pulled up next to ours. At this point, My husband and I were tired of waiting, so I went back on let go to see if she had messaged me something new. I looked up our conversation and at the top of our messages was a banner that read this user has blocked you. I showed my husband this, and because we listened to so many horror stories on YouTube, we both got creeped out, and my husband got very angry. He told me to wait in the truck with the doors locked while he went inside the McDonald's and asked the manager if anybody named Kisha worked there, taking my phone with him to show evidence of our conversation. So I did just that, and waited in the truck with my finger glued to the lock button. A few minutes later he comes back to the truck with a concerned look on his face. He told me that the manager said that there was a girl named Kisha that worked there, but she spelled her name Kisha instead of Kisha and she had been sent home at 11 this morning because of business decline. It was in that moment that I put two and two together. The only person we saw come out of the restaurant was a man on a phone, who quickly got into a car parked next to ours. I never told Kisha that I was coming with my husband. For all that they knew, I was just coming by myself a good 15 miles away from where I lived in the bad part of town. 
I was terrified. We peeled it out of the parking lot and raced back home. On the way back, I deleted my let go app. Now, I know this sounds like a lot of speculation, but I am almost certain that this I was almost the victim of abduction because there have been several cases of women in Richmond other areas of Virginia who have used let go and other resell apps like it and have gone missing, been robbed at gunpoint, or been taken in by human traffickers. This story isn't really as scary as it could have been, and I am very grateful for how lucky I was. I'm forever thankful that my husband came along with me, because if he didn't, there's a good chance I wouldn't be typing this story tonight. But I really wanted to tell my story as a way to spread awareness that there are some very evil people out there, in everyone's cities, and even in your neighborhoods. They will use every method of communication to find their next victims, even resell websites and apps, to lower someone in and do unspeakable things to them. Abductions resulting in human trafficking cases are at a national all-time high, and are only getting worse. Please, be careful of who you talk to online. If you do sell something on one of these apps, on Craigslist, or any other resell site where you have to meet the other person in person, always meet in a public place at a popular time of day. Bring somebody with you. Never let them come to your house, or you theirs. It's crazy to think about how cautious we have to be nowadays, and I hope all these evils and crimes go away soon. But until then, please be safe and be smart. I've been looking to sell my car before the summer is over, so I took to Facebook and Craigslist to find potential buyers in the area who were willing to take it off my hands. I posted my ad on Facebook Marketplace, which is essentially Craigslist for Facebook where you can buy and sell products around your approximate location. I figured it would be the perfect place to find someone near me who was in the market for an old fixer-upper, my piece of junk, that is. I should add at this point that I'm a 22-year-old woman, and on Marketplace obviously you post from your Facebook account, so whoever sees my posts can go to my profile to message me. Unfortunately, unlike Craigslist, people knew exactly who I was before they were buying. I had several people interested, so I answered them in order, and the first person just so happened to be an older woman. From her page, she looked harmless, so I thought it would be no problem. I was busy for a few days so I told her I'd get back to her soon, and she said okay. Her last message to me said that's fine. Let me know Thursday. Bill. A little weird, but I thought maybe her husband was messaging me for her from her account, or maybe it was even a typo. Who knows? I gave her the benefit of the doubt. On Thursday, I got a random message from another account, a man who will call Bill. He messaged me the exact same message as she did the day before, which was something along the lines of interested, when can I come see it? I put two and two together and realized that the woman signed Bill on her last message the day before and I figured it was her husband now contacting me from his own account. I asked if he was the one who messaged me from her account the day before, and he confirmed, saying that she was his wife who had passed away back in March. Strange. But everyone has their own way of coping. At this point, I felt bad for the guy, and there weren't really any alarm bells going off other than that it was slightly weird he was contacting me from his dead wife's Facebook. It was also weird that his Facebook didn't have any photos of himself, just his backyard as his profile picture and cover photo. I chalked it up to him being older and not caring about social media. He ended up saying he'd like to see the car and we scheduled a day for him to come look at it. Unfortunately, I had to give him my house address because the car's brakes are not in working order and the car isn't insured, so I couldn't take it on the road to somewhere nearby to meet up. Regardless, I was still not too worried because my boyfriend and his mother were at the house, I live with them in the summertime, so I thought if push came to shove, there would be someone there to mediate. He was supposed to come at 3.30, but 3.30 came and went without him showing up. He said he lived in a town about a half hour away, so we waited a little while after to see if maybe he would come late. I was pissed for a while, because he just wasted my time confirming he wanted to see my car and possibly buy it, 
and he stood me up without any explanation. Around 4, I gave up and started playing some games on my laptop. My boyfriend, bless his soul, still kept watch over the driveway to see if Bill would come out after all. Suddenly, he had urgency in his voice. Alyssa. I think that's him. I got up and ran to the window just in time to see a small car with an unknown driver and a young man in the front seat pull away from the front of our driveway. Apparently, the car pulled in front of the house and sat there for several seconds before driving away, and I just caught the tail end of it. I live on a quiet side street of a pretty safe suburban neighborhood, so it most likely wasn't some random stranger who just so happened to be passing by, they were definitely in front of the house waiting for a minute. My boyfriend looked disturbed and kept repeating that he was sure it was them, and that they got cold feet. We all thought it was weird that they would drive a half hour only to leave. My boyfriend's mother said she thought it was because they thought they could get me, a vulnerable young woman, alone, and that they'd sped away once they saw that there were several cars in the driveway. One of the cars was the one I was selling, too and it looked exactly like in the photos I posted on Marketplace, so I was sure the car wasn't the issue. The most disturbing thing to me was the fact that there were two people in the car, and at least one of them looked like he was capable of doing something, should I have been alone? Thank God in hindsight that there were several people home, or the situation definitely could have escalated. I really, really wish I hadn't given them my address, and I can only hope that those people don't ever come back. I don't post a lot, and English is not my first language, so I apologize if there's anything wrong here. I live in a tall building directly in front of a big wooded area with a creek running through it. Both my mom and I saw a crawler not too long ago. It was pale, had long limbs, and crawled on all fours, among other characteristics. I found this subreddit while searching for information about what we both saw. There are a few birds around that only make sounds during the morning, but at 1 AM last night, I heard what sounded like something trying to mimic an owl but mixed with another sound of another bird. As soon as I heard it, I got chills, and it was coming from the wooded area. I thought it was weird to have a crawler so near to me since all sightings are in North America, but I'm 100% sure of what I saw, and I don't doubt it could really live here, considering my whole part of the town was native land. Can crawlers mimic sounds? Has anybody seen crawlers up around the northern part of Georgia? I was hiking up Blood Mountain a couple of months ago with some friends. At one point on a steeper section of the trail, I can't remember which trail, just that we started on the Freeman Trail, I was trailing behind because I stopped to put some stuff in my bag. When I was catching up and looked to the left of me to see the water flowing down, I saw something which I think matches this sub's description of one. I would have forgotten about it, but as far as I know, the only animals in that area that can grow to be the size of the crawlers you guys describe are black bears, and not only are they not pale, but they typically are around the lower parts of the mountain. I'm still pretty doubtful because it's a pretty popular trail here in Georgia. So, my friends live in the deep woods of North Carolina. The land they live on has always felt very off. You do not want to be on that property by yourself, regardless of whether it's day or night. Multiple people, including myself, have seen this same creature. It is tall, skinny, pale in color, and has white antlers. It hides behind trees and seems to blend in with the tree line. Whenever we see it, it's always at night, and it also makes you feel dread when you see it. In the woods around this house, it's almost like everything is either dead silent or there are too many sounds at once, like rustling in the trees, leaves being stepped on, etc. Out of all the times we've seen this creature, we can only compare it to a mix of a hide behind and a windigo. The other thing is that we feel that whatever this creature is, it's influencing us from inside the house as well. 
The front door they have has a glass window in the middle of it, which is opaque. You can't see through it perfectly, but you can tell if someone or something is outside. Anyways, we have all been too scared to open the door when this happens, but sometimes in the middle of the night, we can see something white moving quickly in front of the front door from inside. We also hear footsteps on the other side of the house, among other issues. I'm wondering if this is from this same creature influencing the inside of the house. Anyways, this thing is really freaking us out, but when we try looking up things like this, we cannot find anything similar at all. Thanks for reading. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.